10 o'clock. Our workshop today is the stakeholder workshop on the operationalization of sustainability and circular economy. I've actually got a few slides that we will or can walk through um, just to get an overview of what we're going to cover um, today. Um, I'm going to take the first five minutes and then I'm going to hand over to our chief host, um, Chief Okunowo, who's going to walk us through a welcome speech. Very excited to be doing this. Um, Honorable Egube is going to give us a welcome from a host state perspective. And we'll take a few goodwill messages and then we will jump immediately into panel one where um, Oscar Onyema will give us the keynote and we will then have a panel discussion, as you can see here, from a number of corporates. We have a good lineup of goodwill messages from Lagos State, from the sustainability professionals, from the FRCN, from AFDB, and um, also from a CEO of Rating Evidence and um, Integrated Ratings, the Integrated Committee. Um, I will go through panelists as we go along per panel. I just wanted to put three ideas on the table in terms of revolutions that we've had. One is we've actually led, Africa has led on a banking and fintech revolution. And it's about time that we acknowledge that. We have also led um, over the last years on a telecommunications revolution, moving from fixed lines directly over to mobile phones. And we were far ahead of many other countries in this regard. In fact, when you're in Germany, you can't really get your pings on your phone, I realize, when you transfer money and otherwise. And it looks like we might be on the cusp of a sustainability and circular economy revolution, whereby we are the ones that lead directly into renewable sources of energy, partly because we haven't built the infrastructure for the old forms of power, but perhaps that is actually an advantage. And the big question now is, how do we take this and um, turn things around? So one of the things we need to align, which is the reason why I'm so delighted to be here. I was saying to Chief Okunawa that two years ago, we crafted the idea of this in his office. I sat there with Alhaji Sada, mm -hmm. and we talked about how do we align sustainability thinking and sustainability doing. And Chief Okunawa challenged me then and has brought me to the table now. So one of the things we want to do is build more resilient institutions. We've also in the interim launched something called Circular Lagos. <clears throat> Sam Egube will speak to that um, himself in more detail. We will talk today also about data why is data so important in terms of ESG and how can we digitize and what are the benefits of digitizing data? We'll talk about accountability for ESG factors. I think most people know by now that I think in terms of seven pillars, and that means that in institutional responsibility for sustainability runs across seven different um, pillars and across the whole organization, not just in parts. These are three compelling why care factors on climate risk. So it's not just because we want to, but because it's not just a rights-based issue, it's also a financial issue that can end up being very, very um, expensive. And lastly, it's also increasingly an oversight and enforcement issue for ESG compliance. If you're looking at the beautiful pictures on the screen, they're actually all honoring a particular artist who's a Nigerian artist who has been globally, <clears throat> and many companies will actually find their waste in the art. So you will find Coca-Cola caps, you will find Unilever packaging, you will find MTN recharge cards, which don't exist anymore because it's all gone virtual. You will find Dangote sacks and Dangote sugar packaging um, across the board. And we'll hear about one of those initiatives later on. Um, today. Um, regulatory compliance, we will hear about in detail from um, the Nigerian Stock Exchange. Oscar is here himself to talk about it. And I think one of our key points is that boards are ideally positioned to drive the operationalization of sustainability and circularity as part of their governance mandate, which is the reason why the IOD really wanted to do this. We have a poll today. There are five questions. We're not going to launch it now because it's time to hand over to Chief Okunawa, who's actually going to be presenting the keynote um, welcome address. And with this, I'm very glad to hand over and to welcome Chief Okunawa, the chairman of the Institute of Directors. Um, who Thank is you. 
host today. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's been a long journey, hasn't it? Fantastic. But can you hear me? Yes, loud yeah. and clear. Well, okay. Oh, thank you very much. Our distinguished speakers, our esteemed panelists, and our dear moderator, members of the Governing Council and Executive Committee of the Institute of Directors here present, particularly the first Vice President, Dr. Mrs. E.J. Didema, and the second Vice President, Mr. Alaji Tijani Borodo, and other members of the uh, uh, PCSC. The fellows and members of the Institute, distinguished participants, gentlemen of the media, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Governing Council of the Institute of Directors Nigeria, I am pleased to join the Chairman of the Research and Advocacy Committee, Professor Nat Ofo, Fellow of the Institute, to welcome you all to this stakeholders workshop on sustainability reporting with the theme Operationalizing Sustainability and Circular Economy, Measuring, Monitoring, Reporting, Impact, uh, impact Investing, and uh, ESG Ratings. I'm elated to note that this event is privileged to have an array of distinguished and seasoned personalities as speakers and panelists. This team of experts in their various endeavors brings to us today the wealth of knowledge and decades of experience to discuss the theme of this event. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the issues for today's discussions are not only germane to the vision and mission of the Institute, they are also critical for our survival and success as individuals, businesses, and as a nation. I'm thus very proud to welcome everyone here today to share your experience and contribute meaningfully to this discourse. Let me at this juncture thank our partner, Dr. Ndidi Inolia Dozien, partner of Kairos and chair of the Circular Economy, Economic Innovation Partnership, the Growing Business Group for the collaboration that made this event possible today. I also appreciate that you agreed to moderate this important event. It's incredible that you agreed to it is incredible to note that the conversation to host this event started in November 2019. I thank you very much for staying through with us to make this day a reality. I wish to crave the indulgence of everyone in attendance to, welcome, to warmly welcome, recognize and appreciate one, each one of our resource persons. The keynote speakers are Mr. Oscar Oyama, OON and fellow of the Institute the Group CEO, Nigerian Stock Exchange Group, PLC, Mr. Patrick Kabuya, Convener, Africa Integrated Reporting Council, and Senior Governance Specialist in the World Bank. Honorable Sam Egube, the Honorable Commissioner for Economic Planning and Budget, Lagos State. Our panelists are made up of Mrs. Uto Kwana, Company Secretary, MTN Nigeria Communications PLC. Mrs. Eunice Sampson, GM and Head Sustainability, Dango Cement PLC. Mrs. Wakama Oyemelukwe, Director of Public Affairs, Communications and Sustainability at Coca Cola. Mrs. Arase Onagise, Executive Secretary, CEO, Food and Beverages Recycling Alliance, FBRA. Ms. Duarte Widig, CEO, IPC Germany. Mr. Claire Mugoji, CEO, Secularium Africa Advisory. Mr. Kola Ino, Chira Partner Ventures Plat Platform. Mrs. Omobo Lanley Victor Lanio, Head of Sustainability, Assets Bank PLC. Mr. Benedict, Benedict Hoffman, Managing Partner of Africa Iros. Mr. Gerrit Lederhoff, the Team Lead, Climate and Responsible Investment. Asian Asset Management in Netherlands. Mrs. Folashadi Ambrose Mebeden, Nigerian Senator, World Business and Angels Forum, and Investor Rising Side Africa. Of course, our Professor Nato Four, Fellow of Institute, Chairman, Research and Advocacy Committee of the IOD Nigeria, Dr. Delakpo Fashawe, 
DG LaSepa Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency, Mr. Richard Wall, co-founder, chief executive officer, MX Software Limited, Professor Kenneth Amaishi, chair in business and sustainable development, University of Edinburgh, Professor Chukubeji Okereke, professor of environment and development in the Global Development Research Division, University of Reading in the United Kingdom. And of course, Professor Sachi Miranda, the founder and director, MBDS. I also wish to especially welcome and thank all of you who have greatly identified with this event with your goodwill messages. I'm warmly welcome other eminent personalities, guests, associates, and friends of our great institute at this event. Ladies and gentlemen, in the past few decades, business performance has been approached from a multidimensional perspective with the introduction of a proactive corporate sustainability reporting system for assessing the performance of an organization and its impact within and beyond the organization on stakeholders like the host community, supply chain actors, and also consider the associated impact on people and the planet. Sustainability reporting is an instrument capable of helping companies become aware of their strengths and weaknesses, better manage corporate risk, improve regulatory compliance, innovate and identify potential synergies and interdependencies across their value and supply chains. The reporting of the business implication of climate change in sustainability reporting becomes even more significant as we celebrate today, the Earth Day, April 22nd. It is also interesting to know that the Nigerian Corporate Governance Code includes a comprehensive section on sustainability and requires that boards establish policies and practices regarding their social, ethical, safety, working conditions, health, and environmental responsibilities, as well as policies addressing corruption amongst others. As a result, the Institute of Directors Nigeria has been involved in advocating for the adoption of sustainability reporting and the operationalization of sustainability across business functions as a core part of the tenants for good corporate governance. Therefore, with sustainability becoming more institutionalized as part of the corporate governance based practices, and with the IOD Nigeria having a significant role to play to raise awareness and build the capacity of its members and non members to set high standards for sustainability governance in Nigeria, the Institute has deemed it necessary to partner with Africa's GMBL Germany, supported by Secular Economy Innovation Partnership, SAIP and Growing Business Foundation, GBF, to bring together corporate Nigeria and relevant regulators in this half-day stakeholder workshop. The aim of this workshop is to, among others, provide insight into global trends, variances in levels of adoption, brainstorm on strategies to incorporate SMEs, gauge levels of corporate interest and capability within corporate organizations, and draw on their insights of academia and regulators operating in this space. This workshop also introduces a range of perspectives on sustainability, circular economy, ESG ratings, and integrated reporting, and paves the way for a series of future workshops to be delivered by IOD and Africairos in the third quarter of 2021. Our distinguished directors and leaders Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to accordingly encourage all of us to be open-minded and participate actively in this workshop so as to make, take advantage of the enormous wealth of experience of our speakers, panelists, and indeed our moderator. Finally, I wish to thank the chairman and members of the research and advocacy committee of the Institute, as well as the management of the IOD Secretariat for organizing this great event. I thank you all for your attention. I wish you a fruitful and beneficial conversation this afternoon. Depending on wherever you are in the world, 
it's either good morning, good day, or good evening. But you're welcome. Thank you very much. I now yield to the moderator. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chief. Right on time. Perfect timing. I'm going to ask Thank Amanda you. if um, he's here. Thank you so much for that opening. I think we have Parmender who we need to upgrade um, the status of um, from the World Bank. Um, and I'm gonna ask Ihai and Innocent um, Okosa of the Nigeria Integrated Reporting Committee and the Federal Reporting, Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria to make their goodwills next. Nice. And we're generally speaking okay. one to three minutes. Parmender is here. Okay, over to you. All right, thank you so much, uh, Dr. NDD, and uh, congratulations to everybody for organizing this great event. I particularly want to thank the Institute of Directors and Afri Kairos for organizing the event. I think it's very, very timely, and it's Wait, really is with... Hello, yeah, I don't have great bandwidth. That's why, you know, I'm only doing the audio portion. I am actually telecommuting. I'm, I'm based normally based in Abuja, but I'm telecommuting from a small village in India right now. Okay. Right. So that's the reason. But uh, I think, you know, look, I think it's really wonderful. This event has been organized. We need many more events like this. I think this is a time for everybody to provide an input into developing good guidelines, which can actually work for Nigeria and work for Africa and work for a lot of developing countries. Huh? I think, uh, Nigeria, we've closely followed the way that the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance has developed. You know, you used to have so many codes, each used to be sector specific, and it really was a difficult situation until the Financial Reporting Council introduced a standardized code, the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance in 2019, which is now being rolled out across all the sectors, right? I think for the sustainability corporate governance code, we need to follow exactly a similar kind of procedure. We don't want industry specific fractured kind of situations. And, you know, like I said earlier, we need many more discussions like this. So what is the role of the bank in, in this entire process? And I'm so glad my colleague uh, Patrick Kabuya is going to give a keynote address. I think overall the bank has, you know, sort of three main areas it works in. One is obviously as a lender. Last year in 2020, the bank lent $77 billion across the world. And during the COVID crisis, in a period of 15 months, the bank is going to provide $160 billion worth of support to countries across the world. Right, And out of this, around $47 billion is going to come from IFC for the private sector. So it is you know, a huge source of financing for countries and companies across the world. And if you just look at last year, the World Bank alone provided more than $20 billion for climate related projects you know, across the world. So three broad things that the bank works in. Firstly, you know, obviously we are closely involved in the global policy on climate change. And, and we provide input at that level. Second is really through IFC, we, we provide significant funding, especially in developing countries, you know, on supporting the climate change agenda and standards such as, you know, the sustainability standards, which will be coming out. And thirdly, you know, as an institution, we help countries, you know, issue green bonds and, and you know, even ourselves, we raise a lot of funding from the marketplace for providing funding to both IBRD and IDA lending to countries across the world, right? And we are certainly very aware and cognizant of, for, for, you know, what is happening in the sustainability space. So I think, look, this is what we are talking about today is really developing a code for the 21st century. A lot of previous codes have been focused, you know, mainly on financial reporting on profits. I think, uh, as the previous speaker said, you know, there's now time to expand the scope and include people, include the planet along with profits as we go forward. So thank you, Parmender. And we will yeah, be thank you. you and we'll yeah. be working with you going forward. I think what we're trying to do with this is build capacity internally. And so we will lean on you. We will come back to you. This is not your last um, coming out here. Thank you I so much. Ask Chief to come directly. <laughs> Um, I'm going to call as well. Thank you so much, Parminda, for making the time to come. 
please come home safe, stay safe in India as well. I'm gonna call on um, FRCN Dr. Anya Hara, but I'm looking to see whether Professor Innocent would like to quickly just give us one minute um, before he hops on his flight. And if not, Dr. Anya Hara, over to you. Two minutes, please. Thank you very much. Um, the moderator and everybody, I congratulate you for this wonderful um, outing. Um, the Financial Reporting Council is delighted uh, to be part of this conversation today, having organized a similar event last year where even Dr. Ndidi took over the moderation and uh, drove the discussion to a very um, greater height. Obviously, today's conversation with the areas of experts simply signifies conscious awareness of sustainability reporting and related issues by various organizations. As you may be aware, a lot is going on in this area globally, but in our jurisdiction, we are just beginning and therefore there is need to ensure a sustained momentum to align with present realities globally. At the council, we issued the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance 2018, which uh, Chief Okunowo has alluded to, particularly principle number 26, dealing with sustainability issues. Um, with some recommended practices. In furthering the issue, we are currently partnering with other agencies through a technical working group to develop a reporting framework to ensure that entities' reports capture their contributions to sustainable development goals. Our engagements with relevant development partners show positive response and commitment towards achieving this laudable goal. The Financial Reporting Council of Nigeria believes that there is a need for a global set of internationally recognized sustainability reporting standards that will provide a single framework of sustainability for global consistency. This will bring under one umbrella the current fragmentation in sustainability reporting and ensure that standards speak a common language. Engaging in sustainability practices and reporting can only thrive where they are anchored on integrated thinking and by extension, integrated reporting. This is one veritable source Nigeria companies should utilize to governize our economy to operate at optimal level in order to create the much needed employment. We appreciate the efforts of the Institute of Directors, Africarius, CF and Global Business Foundation for providing this platform and look forward to working with you all towards achieving the desired outcome. We wish everybody full food deliberation. Thank you and God bless. Dr. Anyara, thank you so much. Always such a pleasure to work with you, always. Thank you. Thank you. We're glad to have FRCN here. I'd like to call on, I know we have the, um, the Honorable Commissioner for Economic Planning and Budget online. He's been kind enough to wait until we finish the goodwill addresses and then he will speak just before um, Oscar. Um, Dr. Okwas, I see you're ready. You're on mute. I'm gonna give you okay. one minute. All right, okay. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Didi, for inviting Nigeria Integrated Reporting uh, Committee to this uh, event. Um, we are grateful and honored to be part of this uh, program. Um, the Nigeria Integrated Reporting Committee um, is formed to promote the integration between sustainability and financial reporting. Um, when we talk about the circular economy, uh, one thing that is clear is um, its effort in trying to um, eliminate waste and uh, promote continuous use of uh, resources. Uh, and therefore, circular economy turns waste and externality into resources that organizations uh, can use. Uh, but the issue is that while we do this, it is the reporting that is essential. Uh, when we talk about sustainability, you talk about financial. Sustainability is in silos. Financial on its own is in silos. 
But what integrated reporting does is to bring the two together. And if I'm a director sitting on the board, managing these companies, I should be able to have uh, a global picture by having that report that integrates both sustainability issues and the financial. And then I'm in a position to manage the affairs of the companies very well. And I think this seminar is a good forum for us to progress discussions in this uh, area. And then I wish the uh, uh, forum and the seminar a fruitful deliberation in this area. Thank you, Undidi. Dr. Okwesa, thank you so very much. Again, very brief and to the point, we're very grateful for NIRC's support and commendations on your great work. I'm going to call on Professor Ameshi, and I'm going to ask Honorable Egobe to please be ready because I will call on him next. Professor Ameshi of the Association of Sustainability Professionals of Nigeria, we're glad to have you here. Okay, thank you very much, Ndidi, and, and good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, or good evening, wherever you are. Um, on behalf of the Association of Sustainability Professionals of Nigeria, we wish to congratulate um, Africairos and IOD for putting this program together. Sustainability has always been a challenge, and we are glad that we are keen to move from ideas to practice. And I know Ndidi and her team do very well when it comes to translating big ideas into action. And one word or an idea I want to leave you with is to always think of sustainability as impact management. It's very easy to be carried away by the idea of sustainability as box ticking. And um, hopefully by the end of today, we will come to the point where we begin to see sustainability more as a way of life, as a culture. And that's one way and a critical way to move forward. If sustainability becomes a way of life, a culture, and an irritation. On behalf of the association, we want to thank you again for putting this together because it will make our work very easy for us. And if we're able to convince the people who have the money to think about sustainability, that's our job done. So indeed, thank you very much. And I'll be here to listen to the rest of the conversation. Great, Kenneth. Thank you, Professor Mishi. We're glad to have you here right till the end. I see Honorable Egube is here now. Um, ready to speak. We have one more goodwill message that hasn't been said. Honorable Igwe, can I ask um, Dr. Everling to very quickly talk about his perspective on ESG ratings and Africa? And then hand over to you. Dr. Everling, if you're ready, you have a minute. To switch on my mic. Okay, thank you. I thank you for the kind introduction and the opportunity to be at this important conference today. The date could hardly have been chosen better because last month, it is exactly 30 years since I met those people at a conference in Germany who played a key role in the development of systems, methodologies, processes, and criteria for rating organizations according to ethical, ecological, and social criteria. With the first beginnings in, the 1991, in 1991, a project team with the name Ethical Ecological Rating developed a set of criteria for the ethical assessment of enterprises the so-called Frank, Frankfurt Hohenheimer guidelines. The criteria aim to analyze the dimensions of environmental, social, and cultural sustainability for companies and products. Today, the guidelines are still remembered and referred to as the world's most comprehensive set of criteria for the ethical assessment of companies. For historical reasons, Afrikairos is one of the few firms that has an in-depth understanding of both the criteria and the seven pillars approach. Initially, the focus was on scientific work and thorough research on all aspects of the topic. However, from the beginning, it was a goal for us to ensure that it could be implemented in practice. Therefore, in 1999, a separate rating agency was founded called ERCOM Research, which was fully dedicated to the implementation of the concept. At that time, my contribution as a chairman of the supervisory board 
was to get the rating agency established as a commercial company that would be able to offer sustainability ratings in the long term without being dependent on donations or generate revenues from investors, since they value sustainability ratings as a valuable source of information. The success speaks for itself. Three years ago, the company was sold to a traditional shareholder service in the US. It has since been integrated by the German Stock Exchange, which was the last year. Rating criteria are of interest to all medium sized large companies now. Roughly, we can distinguish effects in two ways. Firstly, it affects suppliers and customer relationships. And secondly, investments and financing in the financial markets. In Germany, we will have a new <clears throat> legal situation. Richard, Richard. This mic still switched on? Yep. And yeah, so I'm going to get Richard to switch off his mic. Because Richard? I I'm, don't know whether there are questions for I'm me. Not, okay. No, they're not. And, and I, um, um, uh, Dr. Everling, because you were on the panel before, I know you're treating this more like a panel discussion. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping that you will be able to come back for your panel. But I'm going to ask you to round up because we need to take Honorable Egobi. Yeah. Um, you know that I have to leave. Um, perhaps I could make my points now so that I don't need to, to stay all the time. We spoke about that. Is that okay? That's fine, except that this slot is shorter. <laughs> so you have literally you have 25 seconds to go. Okay. Well, um, then I will leave it to the discussion later and I will wait for you uh, when you call me. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm sad to make it so abrupt and I'm totally immersed in what you were saying and we're going to call you back and we're going to be leaning on your expertise. I'll just close for you and say that um, Dr. Eberling was very Im instrumental in taking the social ratings from Germany to China many years ago. And so we're going to call on him to support us here in Nigeria as well, working very closely with the IOD. And um, Honorable Egube, we're now over to you. You're our host state, um, and you have waited patiently to listen to the Goodwills. We're very grateful for that, very happy about that. And um, we now look forward to your own presentation and your welcoming, welcoming us with your keynote this morning. Over to you. I'd like to call um, Dr. Egube, Dr. Egube. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ndidi. Um, I'd like to recognize um, Chief Chris Okonowo, fellow of the IOD, President Chairman, Governing Council for IOD Nigeria. Um, I also like to recognize Mr. Oscar Oyema, OOM, who is also a fellow, a Group Chief Executive Officer for the Nigerian um, exchange, Stock Exchange Group, PLC. Um, I would like to also acknowledge all fellows and members of the IOD who are present and uh, distinguished um, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank you. Um, thank you very, very much for inviting me um, to deliver this brief keynote um, to stakeholders at this workshop on operationalizing um, sustainability and circular economy. This workshop is coming at a time when Lagos state government seeks to rebuild our dear state. We want to build back better, stronger, and more sustainable. This in line with the themes agenda of the current governor, our amiable leader, Mr. Governor Babajide Olushola Soonlu. I would like also to commend the Institute of Directors Africairos and Circular Economy Innovation Partnership for seeking to address the capacity gap across the public and the private sector. It is pleased to note that this stakeholder workshop will give rise to more knowledge, share capacity building on sustainability and circular economy 
going forward. This workshop avails us the opportunity to learn from one another and facilitate the convergence of thoughts, experience and knowledge while developing an economy that is more distributive, inclusive and can help achieve growth and simultaneously address the threats of high unemployment in our society and in the state. Mr. Governor at the World Secular Economy Forum plus Climate Event, hosted by the government of the Netherlands and the Finnish Innovation Fund. This speak about Secular Lagos, an initiative which was launched by the Secular Economy Innovation Partnership, CIP, and Afrikairos in 2020. He made commitments on the state's transitioning to a secular economy, which we are incorporating right now in our 30 year development plan for Lagos, because we want Lagos to be a model for secular economy in Nigeria, Africa, and the rest of the world as stated clearly uh, in terms of our aspiration of the vision of the state. We want to be that model mega city, Africa's model mega city. We want to be a global economic and financial hub that is safe, that is secure, that is functional, productive. So when we say, talk about circular economy, um, it basically aligns with that vision. And it's not just comparing Lagos just with other cities in Lagos, but we must compare Lagos, as our vision says, with leading cities across the world and Africa specifically. Now, this can never happen without strong engagement partnerships across several sectors with development partners, the private sector, with different forms of governments, like local government, the federal government. Um, and of course, when we talk about the private sector, you cannot take it home without speaking to members of the IOD, which is crucial in this regard. What makes Lagos unique is the idea which we hold very dearly, which is now part of our DNA, that idea around partnership. It's something that plays all the time. I'm just coming from an event where we are launching the Agri five-year roadmap, and it is clear that it's about partnership. Um, not too long ago, we completed the hosting of the Lagos Economic Summit meeting at Hibeti, and again, it's about partnership, not just what government will do, but also what the private sector will do and what the private sector working together with government can also deliver. It's our belief that when the private sector prospers, Lagos will prosper. And you cannot talk about sustainable prosperity without addressing secularity um, of the economy. It is of great essence that our collective effort towards a sustainable society can be measured, monitored, and evaluated in a way that is acceptable and aligns with global best practices. Lagos State will consider enabling policies that will enhance incentives for the private sector to report sustainability and circular economy as we need to hold each other accountable, both government and private sector whereby material data and data integrity is key to tracking, monitoring, and improving our collective performance. The companies that produce the Economic and Social Governance Report, ESG, are called upon the effort to aggregate this impact footprint and data across economic, social, and environmental material indicators and Lagos State is committed to being a partner to support and work with IOD, Africairos, and other collaborating partners in these areas. Because a strong performance in this area um, will be kudos and to the benefit of us all together. For us in the public sector, we have embarked on making circular economy concrete through our partnership with Circular Economy Innovation Partnership in facilitating work groups 
like this that are targeting pollution, waste reduction, resource efficiency, true circular economy engagement, and innovation challenge. Furthermore, we will embark on capacity building, both as a state government, but also working with partners like IOD and Afrikairos in the various formation in which we engage our people. Basically, to ensure that our MDAs, our processes are enabled to attract the right kind of investments and partnership in achieving the targets and ambition of a greater secular Lagos. Once again, appreciations to the Institute of Directors and their co-organizers, including Africa, CIP, and GBF, for providing this platform for fostering a mutually beneficial public-private partnership needed to achieve, achieve this shared vision. It is my sincere hope that the key takeaway from this workshop will further advance our common agenda and in the process secure a safer and more resource efficient state with opportunities for every citizen and resident to realize their dreams. Thank you very much um, for this invitation and the opportunity to participate um, in this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Igube. We're going to be counting on you. We're going to be counting on a Lagos state government that is in partnership with the private sector and that incentivizes um, action. Um, so we will come back to you over and over and over again. I'm going to call on Oscar now um, from the Nigerian Stock Exchange. I'm looking for him. Oscar, can you put on your camera? And because you have been so implemental and instrumental, and because you have a new structure now, which we're all keen to learn about, um, you will have 13 minutes instead of 10. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ndidi. Uh, that uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me just say that that uh, 13 minutes was highly negotiated. Uh, I would have wanted more time. <laughs> um, it is my pleasure to be here. Uh, I must um, acknowledge the chairman of uh, the Council of IOD uh, and uh, Dr. Ndidi for inviting me to participate in the discussions uh, today. Uh, I also thank all the other uh, organizers of this uh, workshop for really giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts as I deliver this keynote address to the experts, business leaders, and other professionals convened uh, on this webinar. I must note that uh, a number of the uh, key things I would like to state, um, you can actually get in my presentation, which will be shared after this um, uh, talk that I'm giving. Uh, so uh, please bear with me as I jump through the global aspects of my discussion and focus more on the Nigerian Stock Exchange and what we're doing to move forward sustainability, uh, the measuring, monitoring and reporting of it, and how we're influencing listed companies uh, to do the same. As many of you may know, the Nigerian Stock Exchange has recently been successfully demutualized and transitioned into a new non-operating holding company. Nigeria Exchange Group, PLC. The group has three wholly owned operating subsidiaries, uh, namely the Nigerian Exchange Limited, the Operating Exchange, NGX Regulation Limited, the Independent Regulation Company, and NGX Real Estate Limited, the Real Estate Company. After 10 years of service to the former Nigerian Stock Exchange, I was greatly honored to have been appointed the Group Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of NGX Group. Permit me, therefore, to speak more as an enabler for business sustainability and the circular economy, as well as to, uh, and to discuss some of the impacts 
we have had unlisted company awareness and reporting, having had the rare privilege of running the nation's foremost exchange for about a decade. A number of the speakers today have already touched upon uh, measuring sustainability and the circular economy. So I'm not going to waste too much time here, um, but it's, I think it is important to just level set and to make sure that we're all on the same uh, uh, level when it comes to the topic that we're talking about. Environmental, social, and governance issues have become a critical aspect of corporate leadership. And this requires in increased attention to compliance, risk management, and governance as a key part of the institutional sustainability pillar. From a regulatory standpoint, the, recent, the recently unveiled Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance, which includes a comprehensive session on sustainability management and reporting is one of the driving forces um, with regards to sustainability reporting in Nigeria. The Nigerian Stock Exchange, uh, the Nigerian Exchange Limited uh, carries on the sustainability disclosure guidelines developed by the Nigerian Stock Exchange as a guide for listed companies on sustainability reporting. This is mandatory for the premium board listed companies. Globally, regulatory requirements on ESG are on the rise. And indeed, I could throw out statistics, but I'm sure you can get all of that uh, in the presentation that is to be shared. From my standpoint at the Nigerian Exchange Group, ESG issues have become critical to the investment decision-making process. Globally, there has been a big shift in capital allocation in favor of sustainable investments. According to the 2019 Bloomberg publication, investments in the form of green or sustainable investments grew by over 30% from $23 trillion in, 20, tri trillion in 2017 to $30.7 trillion in 2019. I think you all agree with me that green bonds are increasingly considered to have transitioned from niche to mainstream uh, in, in global investments. You could say the same uh, for COVID-19 uh, bond market, which has reached about 65 billion. Uh, again, uh, that is just emphasizing the, the, the point that investments are increasingly driven by sustainability. The imperative for sustainable development has been clearly established. The year 2020 officially ushered us into the decade of action uh, for the United States, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or the SDGs. Experts have also called the period the make or break decade for climate change, highlighting that the steps we take between now and 2030 will determine whether we can avert the most devastating effects of climate change in the future. <clears throat> Beyond the gloomy picture of the urgent need to act to avert the looming climate crisis and achieve sustainable development targets, the business case for sustainability is alluring. Studies show that achieving the SDGs could open up $12 trillion of market opportunities and create 380 million new jobs that can that action on climate change would result in saving about 26 trillion dollars by 2030. These are big numbers. So what does it mean to have a sustainable business or sustainable business practices? They are practices which at minimum do not harm people or the planet or at best create value for stakeholders. Let's now turn to the concept of secularity. Um, we believe that uh, secularity is at the heart of sustainability. According to the Ellen Makoto Foundation, a secular economy is an economic system where products and services are traded 
in closed loops or circles. Such an economy is characterized by being regenerative with the aim to retain as much value as possible of products, parts, and materials. And uh, you know, if you want to learn more about this, uh, I'm going to share the resolve model, which really goes into details um, about uh, the circular economy. But what I want to uh, pivot to is measuring the impact of some of these practices. Adopting sustainable business practices gives companies the opportunity to manage and measure their performance from a holistic uh, perspective. For example, whilst major international airlines have reported healthy profitability in recent years, researchers at the Harvard Business School factored in previously unaccounted $2.3 and $4.8 billion in environmental costs of Lufthansa and American Airlines respectively. <clears throat> Using an impact-focused measurement tool, the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative, the outcome of the study put both companies as unprofitable and unsustainable. Um, and uh, again, the study used this uh, model to look at uh, over 1,600 companies um, using uh, positive EBITDA uh, numbers uh, to measure. And what we found what the study found is that um, you, you, about 25% of these companies would have their EBITDA results actually reduced uh, if these factors, these environmental factors were taken into consideration. For measuring circularity, the Ellen Makoto Foundation uh, provides tools and indicators that can help companies measure their circularity in terms of products and material flows. Uh, one of such tools uh, is the circular, circulatic uh, indicators developed by the foundation in collaboration with 13 of its strategic partners and member companies and tested by over 30 companies in 2019. The measurement tool that we use at the exchange and in the capital market is the Global Reporting Initiative Standards. Uh, also, uh, which also contains key indicators that can help companies showcase the adoption of sustainable business practices, as well as their adherence uh, to the circular economy uh, principles. The GIR standards remain the most commonly used reporting framework uh, for sustainability reporting, according to the 2020 KPMG survey of sustainability reporting the GRI standards are used by 75% of the world's 250 largest companies sustainability reports. So how does the Nigerian Exchange Limited promote sustainability reporting amongst listed companies? The exchanges are at the forefront of promoting ESG disclosure amongst listed companies. In 2019, the exchange issued the sustainability disclosure guidelines based on the uh, model guidance on ESG reporting issued by the Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative. This advancement made the exchange one of four in Africa and one of 56 global members of the uh, Sustainable Stock Exchanges Initiative to issue written guidance on ESG disclosure. The guidelines articulate a, system, a systematic approach to integrating sustainability into an organization's activities and provide indicators that should be considered when issuers provide annual disclosure on ESG issues. The exchange has an ongoing partnership with the Global Reporting Initiative to conduct trainings and workshops to build the capacity of listed companies on ESG reporting. Further to the issuance of the sustainability disclosure guidance, uh, with guidelines, um, we hosted a sustainability reporting implementation workshop in partnership with the GRI. This was a way of helping listed companies understand the ESG reporting requirements of the recently launched sustainability disclosure guidelines. 
Since the issuance of the disclosure guidelines, we've hosted various capacity development sessions in partnership with GRI, including a roundtable on the Sustainable Development Goals in July of 2019, Sustainability for Financial Analysts and Communication Practitioners in September of 2019, and the launch of the GRI tax standards in 2020. We've made progress since we started this journey as 17 out of the 157 listed companies have published their sustainability report in the last two years. To facilitate the discourse on ESG issues amongst listed companies and the key stakeholders, we launched the facts behind the sustainability report uh, series which is fashioned after the NGX's flagship facts behind the listing and facts behind the figures uh, series. The, first, the facts behind the sustainability report uh, is designed to provide the investing ecosystem with details of listed companies' sustainability reports, whilst allowing them to further engage with the listed companies on ESG issues. Since inception, five listed companies have used this platform to highlight their sustainability efforts through our facts behind the sustainability report series. Amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, we tailored the facts behind the sustainability report uh, series to become a virtual event to enable more issuers share their progress on sustainability with their key stakeholders. In conclusion, let me reiterate the potential of adopting sustainable business practices and circularity to significantly increase the baseline of a business by maximizing resource use and reducing expenses. However, mainstreaming sustainability and circularity will require an overhaul of how a company measures its value. Identified barriers need to be addressed, awareness raised, opportunities for action and engagement seized, and capacity built. Innovation will also play a crucial role as we look to conduct our businesses in line with global standards to create shared value. Through dialogues like this, I believe we will be able to chart new approaches for sustainable development particularly for the adoption of transparent disclosure for the Nigerian business client. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Oscar. And um, thank you also for bringing back great memories. I know we were very proud um, to actually beat it. Well, that was my last life. Without further ado, I'm very, very pleased right now. Oscar, I hope you can stay for a few minutes and listen to at least the first round. I'm gonna call on my panelists. I've sent everybody a message already and we're going to go quickly through a round. I'm gonna speak very little um, in this moderation. If we can just go in the order of Uto, Yunus, Amaka, Arase, Dörte and Clem and spend the first one minute essentially answering the question I gave you in the chat. And that question relates to, I can't find it right now, so I'm just going to speak it, um, relates to partnership. How do we see the corporate sector partnering with the public sector and also with regulators um, in order to achieve this common agenda, which is really a people, planet, profits agenda that is seeking to achieve impacts on the environmental, the social, and the economic um, progress? of our beautiful country, Nigeria, specifically Lagos State, and of course our continent, Africa. And if you can introduce yourselves around that time, that will save us some time that we can spend more time on discussions. So over to you, Uto. Um, thank you very much, Ndidi, and thank you um, to IOD, uh, GBF, and uh, Africa Kairos for inviting us. Uh, and so my name is Uto Mukwana, and I'm the company secretary of MTN Nigeria. And part of the role I play is um, because the board takes direct responsibility for sustainability, um, that is how important um, ESG is um, to us. 
and um, as, a, as a communication and digital um, enabler. Um, we are very, very aware of the responsibility and how crucial our role is. Um, I believe if there is one thing that COVID has brought to the fore uh, is the need to stay connected. Uh, and fourth to us is the fact that everyone deserves the benefits of a modern connected life. I mean, between uh, March 2020 and today, um, everyone, if we were to take a poll here, um, everyone has seen how important it is, even this platform, uh, being possible because of the services uh, that the, the sector provides. And going straight into your question, again, COVID has brought to the fore the importance of um, several things, particularly infra investment in infrastructure. Um, so for instance, if we look at our sector, uh, the, the, the broadband strategy, it is very, very important that even as a private sector player, that we partner with the government to ensure that uh, these infrastructures are available. Um, if we look at whether it is the education sector um, for, I mean, school children, most of them have, um, have uh, transited to um, digital learning platforms and including most of us that even work from home. Uh, we can see how important it is that we have those infrastructure. So I believe that um, there will be greater partnership. There will be greater focus on, and it will definitely be uh, a much more topical issue, uh, not just from an investor point of view, but from a public-private partnership um, towards rebuilding our um, communities in a more and more resilient um, uh, manner. I, I believe I'll pause there since you gave me one minute. No, that's an, that's an excellent. So in other words, you're reaching out the hand to partnership. Can I call on Amaka? Can I just ask everyone to mute? Just please. And Amaka, if you're not ready, let me go back to the order. Eunice, if we go by the program. Okay, Amaka, go for it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, depending on where you sit. Uh, my name is Amaka Onyebelukwe. I'm the Director for Public Affairs, Communication and Sustainability for the Coca-Cola Company here in Nigeria. And in my role, I also coordinate a lot of activities uh, with different NGO bodies under the Coca-Cola Foundation to execute high-impact environmental, social, and projects around various communities. So coming to the question uh, that you asked, how we can drive or we foresee partnership with governments or regulators. For me, uh, I would say that the impact of COVID has actually shown us that we need a lot of partnership, uh, be the health sector, on education, on the environment. Uh, we've seen how we can actually achieve a lot when we do come together. Uh, there's a lot of infrastructure deficit gap uh, there's a lot of data, uh, lack of data around driving various investments or achieving a whole lot, which the private sector have actually mastered or used to make some informed decisions. So we all talk about big data analysis, how it has actually driven a lot of investment into a particular sector. So we believe that this expertise that the private sector has built can actually be transferred if we can actually partner with the government to be able to open up these sectors and drive more investments uh, in the areas that support health, education, for example, we saw uh, a lot of our students going digital during the lockdown, and then even till now, the new world that we are living in. How are we able to evolve the societies if we can actually come together? Because, um, and also, for example, how can we also execute high impact projects uh, it can only be, po be possible by driving the private sector and the government partnership, because together we will be able to leverage the resources in a better coordinated manner and use the, the data to drive both investment, participation, and drive more impact driven, uh, dri driven across the communities, even in the post COVID era. So for me, it's how can we enable more partnership from the private sector 
with the government to be able to share the learnings that we have as a private sector and the efficiencies that we have built to bring it to the uh, to the government to be able to to reach more impact. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amaka. I'm going to call on Eunice now, and I'm going to ask everyone to hold on to that question of how do we take it beyond large corporates and government to actually reach the real sector and obviously smaller and middle tier businesses, which is where the resilience of the economy lies. Um, I'm also calling out to um, Mr. Onyema, if he's still here, to just respond to one question that I have in the chat um, in terms of compliance before he leaves, if he can. Um, Eunice, over to you. And if Oscar is still here, maybe he will respond before we take the next three one minutes. Eunice, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ndede. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yudis Samsi, and I head uh, sustainability at Dangote. And uh, the circular economy uh, and um, uh, social investments uh, are some of the key uh, priorities of Dangote at this time. And uh, we are working uh, together with all the other key functions to be able to drive this and to deliver on our corporate responsibilities. Uh, on the question, I would say that um, one of the things that COVID has achieved uh, and actually is a very big achievement is uh, uh, helping the businesses and even the government to identify the gaps uh, that have been thrown up. Uh, if you look at the crisis in the health, uh, health sector uh, at the very beginning of the, uh, the COVID uh, outbreak, uh, so it's yeah, we're able to tell that one of the things that we need to intensify uh, in terms of our social investments and community interventions is healthcare. Uh, so um, it, it has also thrown up the need for the uh, private sector to collaborate more and to partner more uh, with government. Uh, it became more obvious than ever before that government alone can actually not meet uh, the developmental needs uh, of the, you know, developing economies such as ours. Uh, it, it also helps to, to show that, um, you know, businesses need to do more. Uh, businesses need to uh, be more, uh, get more sensitive uh, to the needs of the society and also be able to deliver um, on our corporate uh, responsibilities. And uh, still on COVID, um, it also demonstrates that uh, indeed partnership uh, does work. Uh, if you look at the likes of uh, initiatives such as the uh, CACOVID, how all the, the major businesses and uh, some uh, government agencies came together uh, to, to rally around uh, government to ensure that, you know, we as a country was able to confront COVID. Uh, so more than ever before, we see uh, how important the, uh, Sustainable Development Goals 17 of the uh, United Nations is that everything revolves around uh, effective uh, partnership, especially between uh, the public and the private sector. Uh, I just see I'm on mute. Thank you so much, Eunice, um, for that response. Um, healthcare indeed. We saw the private sector come through with the government. Arase, Food and Beverages Recycling Alliance, and I'm going to feed in something here. I see Nicholas Ajana has put something in the chat about PEP bottles being used for wood and school furniture. I know that circular economy is one of the things that you're championing. I'm very glad to have you here. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ndidi. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this very important discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm delighted to be here to be part of this. First, I would like to quickly introduce myself before I go on to the question. My name is RSA Lucia Onagise, the Executive Secretary of the Food and Brewery Recycling Alliance, also called FBRA. The Food and Brewery Recycling Alliance is the industry coalition for the food and brewery sector that is set up as a producer responsibility organization to ensure that manufacturing organizations in the food and brewery sector come together to have a commitment towards enhancing collection and recovery of post-consumer packaging material for the environment. When we talk about post-consumer packaging materials, you and I are consumers. Everyone here is a consumer. 
So what do we do when we enjoy the products from the food and beverage sector? Um, what do we do with the packaging material? And that's where the Food and Beverage Recycling Alliance comes in. Um, currently, we have 17 members. Uh, we started off with four founding members from multinationals in the food and beverage sector, and we're working on different initiatives. Going to your question on um, partnerships. Partnerships are very important because looking at our major focus areas, we have three major focus areas, and the three major focus areas borders on partnership. A typical example, enhancing collection and recovery of this packaging material, like PET bottles, someone mentioned. How do we do that? We do that through partnerships. So we have collector, collectors across Nigeria, mostly from the Recyclers Association of Nigeria. So we partner with them. They are small and medium scale companies that we partner with to ensure they can actually collect this packaging material from the environment. Secondly, uh, industry, industry dialogue and influence. We work with policymakers, we work with the government, we work with different partners, international partners, to ensure that policy provides an enabling environment. That shows another way of partnership. And lastly, our third focus area, which is awareness creation. We know the need for awareness and education in this part of our, 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 the climb, and the need for us to continue to create that awareness. How do we do that? We do that through community engagement, going to the different communities, to, to engage with them at the grassroots level, to ensure that people know about this um, recycling and the productive use that these materials can be used for. Like someone mentioned that it can be used for decks, yes. So these are the different ways we partner. Another typical example, this, this workshop we are having shows the need for partnership. Right here, we have the public sector, we have the private sector, we have investors and we have an international community. So there's a need for partnership. The COVID period has also shown us the importance of that partnership, because without partnership, um, we will not be able to go forward in terms of achieving circular economy. Uh, the COVID has also helped us to identify that the environment is an essential sector, and we can help to collectively and collaboratively build that sector to ensure we have, we're able to close the loop in Nigeria and also have the circular economy as opposed to having the linear economy. Thank you. I'll stop here for now. I say, I love it when you speak every time. And we give you extra time because you represent 17 companies. So you're allowed to spill over. Um, and, and thank you for your work. And thank you for referring to the chat. Thank you also to Mr. Onyema for responding to Ihuaku Okoko's question. Is there a time frame to reach 100% compliance from the 100, 157 companies as opposed to the current 10.8% or so? I read his response as I welcome Dörte um, in, who has helped many companies um, work on their sustainability reports um, and achieve compliance. And I think it's particularly admirable that we're not dealing with a regulatory framework where we are forced to comply just to report, um, but rather a regulatory framework where the premium board companies are mandated to comply, but the rest of the list are encouraged to report. And I also want to commend the IOD for really pushing us to pull this together because the Institute of Directors is trying to encourage board directors to ensure that we take this thing seriously in terms of sustainability reporting and also circular economy, not because it's compliance required, but because it's the right thing to do and because it helps businesses grow. So Dörte, I'm handing over to you now and shortly after you, Clem Ugoji, you will both speak about it from a sustainability reporting um, perspective, and then obviously also from a circular economy point of view. Dörte, over to you. Thank you, Lisa. So greetings from Frankfurt to all the participants, the panelists. Um, I'm also grateful for this opportunity to be with you here today. My name is Dörte Weidek, indeed. I'm the managing partner and CEO um, of IPC, which is an advisory firm that advises corporates firms um, on sustainability and development finance. Now, I think I was also invited to speak because somehow I represent two heads or I can wear two heads, which is um, really the corporate side and um, having been um, the CEO of a bank and being in the board of a banking group. While now I'm more wearing the head of an advisor. 
but I know you don't want me to talk about this first. You have posed this question, and the question is an interesting one. And without being too negative or to put too much yeah, grain of salt, this COVID crisis, um, I think, should be a major shock for everybody on various levels. Yeah. Um, because I personally believe that it showed that partnerships have not been built sufficiently enough. Um, so if you talk about, you know, one environment, one economy, one society. Yeah. Hey, bro, um, I'm, on a, I'm on a Zoom call. Let me call you back. Yeah. Hi, Kola. <laughs> Kola, we can hear you. <laughs> um, so we okay. talk, we, we're sharing one place, right? Public sector, private sector, and the civil society. Yeah. Um, so we should have basically one compass and we should go in the same direction. We would, we should work into one direction, right? I don't think COVID has revealed that we do. Yeah. Um, from the corporate perspective, I believe that um, much more needs to be done. Yeah. And here I'm also wearing my banking hat yeah? and not only the advisor, yeah, because advisors can talk, but yeah, they don't do. I think, you know, if as a corporate, we want to drive sustainability strategies, meaning going away from one bottom line, the financial bottom line to a triple bottom line. Yeah? We must engage with the private sector. We must engage with our regulators. Yeah? Because it is not by default that we have the same goals, but we need to align them. We need to align goals, private sector, civil society, and the private sector. There is no way around this to be resilient against next shocks. And there will be others. Yeah? COVID was one, but there will be others. So now I'm getting too negative. Um, and I think I'm halting here with just a strong message. I think we all need to drive partnerships yeah, and come in in having understanding for the objectives and the mandates of the others yeah, in this partnership circle. Yeah, and that is sometimes very hard yeah, because you always feel that your mandate is the most important one. Thank you very much, Dörte. What we love about the Germans is they're very down to earth and you're also drivers of the middle tier as the core of the economy. So start to think about impact because that's going to be a related to your next question. Clem, I can see you. In the spirit of diversity, you are a woman on this panel as an expert on circular economy and so much more. Welcome. Yeah, thanks very much, Ndidi, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Clem Ugoji. I am the lead advisor for Secularium Africa Advisory. I was most recently vice president for public affairs, communication, and sustainability for Coca-Cola across Western Central Africa. So I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, thank you for inviting me. I think the question is very straightforward, and a lot has been said about why we need partnerships and the importance of partnership. So I'm going to take it from you know, a different angle. And for me, the question is, how do we ensure that we can actually build this partnership? Because I think we all know that we need partnership, and we've been talking about it for a very long time. And I think I'm privileged, you know, just coming out from the private sector, going into consultancy. Now I work with governments, I work with private sector, I work with civil society. And it's given me you know, a 360 degree view of what the challenges and the issues are across the sectors. Uh, for me, I think we need a change of mindset you know, for us to be able to build the kind of partnership that can help us solve the kind of unprecedented challenges that COVID has brought to us. And I think that in doing that, it's important for us to understand the fact that when we talk about sustainability or we talk about the imperative of the ESG, we are talking about the shared risks that all of us face, whether we are companies, whether we are governments, whether we are civil societies, whether we are individuals. I think we are all dependent on the environment. And so we need to understand that there is a shared interest that we have in preserving the environment and making the best of it. And closely aligned to that is the fact that, you know, we need to align our interest in terms of what is it that we want to achieve? Because at the end of the day, it's for everyone's interest. Businesses can't prosper without you know, uh, the environment and governments, of course, can't you know, uh, prosper without you know, a good economy, which is what businesses you know, help to build. And so it's important for us to understand that, you know, first of all, is the fact that there is a shared risk that we all face. And so no one is doing anyone a favor you know, by doing what we need to do to preserve the environment. The second is, of course, the shared interest we all have, you know, in protecting this, you know, um, 
joint heritage that we all have. And I think for me, the third element is to have a cooperative mindset. I think more often, you know, business sees government as an auditor, government sees business, you know, as someone, you know, that they need to are smart. But I think it's important, you know, that we have a cooperative mindset in order to be able to solve this problem. And then that will then help us to do what we need to do, which is first and foremost to co-create solutions. I don't think the private sector alone has a solution, neither does the government alone. I think everyone has to come together to co-create that solution and then to co-own the solution. And then related to that is the fact that then we can leverage each other's synergies. Of course, the private sector brings you know, some you know, uh, very, very interesting you know, attributes to the table. Government does the same, civil society does the same, and communities also do the same. So it's important for us to understand that we need you know, these toolkits, psychological toolkits, if I should say, for us to make progress on this issue. Thank you. Clem, I love your voice. See, this is what happens when we manage to um, release people from the corporate sector, stand them on their own and put them out to face because then they can start being part of building all of those bridges. And I'm going to jump right back to, um, to you, Otto. Um, one of the things you talked about was we have about half an hour left to go and I'm going to try and do two more rounds. So let's be brief and focused and I think we can get more out of it. If anybody wants to jump in, you're free to jump in if you're really passionate to say something, otherwise I'll follow the sequence. Uto, we know that, for example, with the three revolutions I spoke about at the beginning, the banking revolution was possible because of technology, the telecommunications revolution where we skipped the entire infrastructure and we leapfrogged in terms of the telecommunications revolution. And now we're looking at the environmental challenge as a huge opportunity. And the only reason why we were able to overcome COVID which everybody has spoken about is partly because we had technology. Exactly what is the vision of MTN in terms of ESG and um, how do you see the telecommunications sector being really able to make a difference there and what is the role of corporates as opposed to just the compliance of corporates on the whole ESG matter? Long question, pick what you like, others will carry on with it. Over to you. You're on mute I think. I think all the panelists that I are all my panelists. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, in, in this day and age, I think one of the most common things we hear is you have to unmute your mic. Um, so forgive me and thank you for pointing that out. Um, so quite a mouthful of a question. I was saying that I will try and dice it as much as I can. Um, one of the things that I said is that um, uh, the sector appreciates what a crucial role it has to play now and going forward. Um, and it supports so many innovations. I mean, one of the things we should look at when we look at our demographics, uh, particularly in Africa, and you can uh, cascade it down to Nigeria. And uh, when you look at the youth population and the potentials for the future, um, the, it, it's just mind blowing and uh, mind boggling how we're also going to harness that great energy and youth and, and in so many areas, whether it is in financial services, whether it's in digital learning, whether it, there's so much that the, the sector, there's so much um, importance that the sector can bring. And um, to, to, to the economic growth and to the uh, digital inclusion journey. One thing that I must pause and say is that ESG is a journey. Um, it's a journey that, um, I, I'm not sure you can leapfrog that journey. It's a journey that you must take uh, baby steps, learn along the way, and um, you know, grow into it, own it. Uh, as someone is always want to tell me, you have to own it. Uh, and so um, it's something that you, uh, that as an organization, you have to own your own story. Uh, but there's so many opportunities. I mean, um, when, uh, Oscar was speaking, he did mention how investors look at uh, how they've integrated um, ESG into their investment decisions. And uh, all around, uh, when you look at it, where, whatever it is, um, you see the ICT element of it. Um, but to, you know, to go to the next phase of your question of saying uh, beyond compliance, 
I do not think that uh, companies should look at ESG as a compliance requirement only. I believe it's very important to look at it from a, a, a shared value and uh, co-creation, as the last speaker said, perspective. Um, if you look at it from a compliance perspective only, it then becomes just a meaningless tick box. Um, I always say that for us, the ESG, our ESG journey should speak, um, should become so granular that it becomes part of the DNA of our activities so that it is built into um, our processes, it is built into everything our employees do, it is built across our value chains, which are quite extensive. And, um, you know, I always say that it should be so clear that it's as much as the last person to leave the office should switch off the light because he comprehends it or he or she comprehends it so granular. Uh, and for us, that is um, why um, in our Ambition 2025 strategy, and I'm sure a lot of other companies um, uh, will have, but for us, we have positioned Have we lost transmission from Uto, or is it just my end? Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, if Uto is gone, I think that was a brilliant contribution and actually gives me a very nice segue into Eunice. I happen to have had the privilege of implementing the seven pillars um, methodology at Dangote. Um, and the entire um, principle of that methodology is to embed in sustainability culture of the organization. I have since left and I hand it over to this awesome woman called Eunice, who's on the panel. And I would like to call on her to, to carry on from where um, Uto stopped off to talk about sustainability beyond compliance and what it actually does when you see it seriously and when you measure it and you um, build ESG into the mainstream of the business. Eunice, over to you. Okay, thank you so very much, Dr. Ndede. Um, so, I, is the first thing really, uh, when you want to uh, mainstream uh, ESG, is to be able to understand that, you know, this is not just a regulatory issue. Um, it is also not a nice to have. Uh, so for any business that really want to uh, be relevant today and, in a way into the future, it is a must have. And uh, one of the challenges we have uh, with uh, sustainability mainstreaming is that temptation to just tick the box and move on. Um, but luckily, a lot of institutions are beginning to see the, the value that sustainability brings. Uh, let's use the example of alternative foil, uh, which is uh, gradually becoming a rave, you know, in the manufacturing uh, sector. Now, it is increasingly very obvious to businesses that if, for example, they are able to leverage uh, the opportunities in circular economy, such as alternative fuel, renewable energy, energy efficiency, and the rest of them, they are actually um, supporting business efficiency and uh, ultimately profits, which is usually the first issue on the table. So um, talking about the seven sustainability pillars, uh, Dangote has done very, very well uh, in using those uh, seven pillars to, to mainstream sustainability across the business and ensure that uh, it is not a project. Sustainability shouldn't be seen as a project. Sustainability is the business. Uh, sustainability is the future of the business. Uh, so with our adoption of the seven sustainability pillars, uh, which uh, uh, Dr. Lady graciously uh, introduced us to uh, Dangote, uh, we have been able to uh, mainstream sustainability and integrate it into everything that the business does. Because the beauty about the seven pillar approach is that um, it is not just environmental sustainability or social sustainability. It is also about institutional sustainability. It is about operational sustainability. It's also about cultural, or uh, sustainability, economic sustainability, and so on. So what that means is that uh, by the time you adopt such a robust approach uh, to sustainability mainstreaming, you find yourself, you know, as a business, touching every aspect of what you do and ensuring that every function uh, aligns with the best practices 
that the principles behind those seven pillars bring. Thank you so much, Eunice, um, for that. I, I, I couldn't have imagined um, handing over to a more inspired and driven um, leader than you are. It's, it always makes me happy to listen to you speak. Um, I see Amaka is way up front and she's rearing to go. And Amaka, you spoke specifically about social impact, which is a big part of that ESG. I don't know. Um, I mean, how do you, especially for Coca-Cola, which is a is a, actually a very lean and mean company, connected with a larger um, local institution. But what's really important, one of the first questions in the chat was actually directed directly at you, um, using pet Coca-Cola bottles to create value and do good. How do we ensure that this sustainability journey, which is considered to be very expensive and really just the domain of the elite companies, trickles down to the mid-tier companies and even to micro companies to create jobs and really transform lives as opposed to being that tick box exercise. How would you like to, would you like to approach that? Yeah, so, so for me actually, um, in fact, um, we, we are not just a small portion of a company because recall that for us at Coca-Cola, we also have a bottling partner, which is Nigerian bottling company, which is a very large, corporation and most recently the Chi Limited, which is another large corporation. So our footprint and impact is very widespread here in Nigeria. And for us actually, um, we believe that sustainability is a core strategy because it sits at the center, because we also know that by the time we, we, we build communities and create more meaningful value and impacts, our businesses simply grow and blossom. So that is quite imperative in terms of building local capabilities, especially at, as it pertains to how we develop or intervene in the small medium scale companies or the, the, the smaller corporations in order to create the kind of impact that we'd like to see. Um, um, we had Arese who spoke, which is um, FBRA, I would, I would say that we are proud that it's actually the, the, the meeting or the coalition, we led a coalition that today, uh, has blossomed into a 17 member co large corporations that have come together to be able to drive more resources to intervene in the plastic or food and packaging uh, beverage uh, waste in Nigeria. And that is something that we are very proud and passionate about because our leadership in this area has started as far back as 2005 when um, the plastic waste or, uh, was not even a, 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 a global challenge. But we foresaw that and we believe that when you actually invest and manage or invest to drive the ESG, you are actually able to proactively manage risk better. You are able to mitigate a lot of um, regulatory sanctions or negative policies. And we have seen that firsthand where self-regulation, it's actually more, uh, it, it, it's actually more, um, I'm trying to find the right word because by the time you are able to drive some of these uh, policies or drive the kind of investments to intervene in this category, you are able to lead the pace in bringing both the government, uh, similar organizations, and even the communities to be able to create more meaningful impact in, 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 in that manner. So for us, we, we actually have when you have people, just to, to, to bring it to the point, because I'm going to try and answer the questions at the same time. When you have people like Nicholas, who is saying, we are seek, seeking partnership with Coca-Cola Nigeria to start using pet bottles for making plastic wood for school furniture and general timber purposes. Let's take him as an example, because there are many people that look to you and, and want to partner. I mean, what, what can we say to, to them pragmatically, practically in the spirit of partnership? Oh, okay. So fantastic. So we have driven a lot of partnerships. So of course, um, we have a lot of people in this category uh, where we have partnered with a lot of them already uh, to produce the plastic chairs that he's talking about in different communities. We have a lot of partnership and I can say that we have a racer on the call. So she's the secretariat that actually houses and sifts through different uh, interface that actually receives applications, interfaces with small or individuals like him to be able to bring to the table 
uh, of some of those partnerships that we could bring to bear. So I would say that we have an open door policy. Uh, we are here on the call, so I'm happy to reach out to him to see how we are going to take some of those things. And, and because we have done that tremendously with so, so, so many people around the, the country today. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think for that reason, um, we also have Dr. Natalie Beinish here, who is the Executive Director of the Circular Economy Innovation Partnership, who's working with Lagos State and also with FIBRA to push a lot of these partnerships along. She'll speak um, later on. I'd like to move on and ask um, Dörte um, whether you can also try to answer that um, same question regarding actually creating more impact through sustainability. Um, and there's a specific question here, for instance, regarding the Nigerian fashion industry, which is one, a polluter, and on the other, on the other hand, um, also a huge employer. Would you have any thoughts to share there? Thank you, Ndidi. I'm not sure whether I'm the specialist to talk to the Nigerian fashion industry. But, um, you know, hearing your niece, um, Uto and um, Nampangba, um, you know, let's be honest. So the moment you're an executive, right, you go in your boardroom and you present the results, you know, you run the board through your operation and financial results, right? And then if you're lucky, they give you five to 10 minutes at the end and you can talk about sustainability, yeah? So I think this is, you know, still normality. That's unfortunate. I think this is what we want to change. Yeah. Now the question is impact, yes. So what is the impact you can produce to your board such that the board starts not putting you and giving you the first 10 minutes of the board session? This is not where I want to go. Where they want to go throughout the entire result presentation yeah they have this lens of yes financial results return operational results while yeah having impact on other levels yeah i think this is where we want to go yeah now my experience um having been the executive of a bank um well i was lucky enough because you know i had a very clear mandate of sustainable finance, agricultural finance, climate finance, yeah, and SME finance. So you might argue, you know, then you're already somewhat closer to impact and sustainability, right? But in the end of the day, I also entered the boardroom. Okay, what are our financial results? Yeah. But I was lucky enough then over the years to understand that introducing and driving the sustainability journey, and Ute, thank you very much for this term. Yeah, there is no quick fix, it's a journey. Yeah that you start to realize that there is a lot of impact really on your financial bottom line. Yeah? So the sustainability agenda will impact also your financial results. And let me quote the most obvious. Yeah? So being able to show that you have a sustainability agenda and report about it will reduce your cost of capital right away. You will have access to other kinds of capital. Yeah? Um, we realized that having the sustainability agenda embedded in all the business processes, we had simply a better loan portfolio quality, yeah, because we were dealing with our clients differently. And you all know lower NPLs means lower loan loss provision, means less write-offs, means better results. Yeah? Also very tangible. You can read it in the results. I think a sustainability agenda supports your business development. Yeah? It brings you in communities and market niches you have not been covered before. Yeah? Because all of a sudden through your sustainability approach, you talk to different kinds of communities and end clients. Yeah? Um, you enter partnerships here, again, the topic of partnership. Yeah? The sustainability agenda makes you talk to potential partners, public sector, civil society, et cetera, et cetera. So together you create, you co-create, and at the same time, it has a positive business impact for you. Yeah. And last but not least, one level I could never imagine that the impact is so high for a corporate, for a company, is on HR. Yeah. So having a credible and well-communicated sustainability strategy speaks to your people, speaks to staff. Yeah. 
they feel belonging to something that also belongs to them. And I speak to the environment, I speak to the communities, um, and last but not least, even the economy. So loyalty, staff loyalty, easier talent acquisition, yeah? um, and a corporate culture yeah, that carries this, this yeah, anti-sustainability strategy. So I know you wanted to hear probably about social impact. But I think it's not realistic only to talk about um, social impact. You know, we will still have to go to our boardrooms <laughs> and make the presentations. We will still have to deliver also the returns. But I think the pledge is that I believe this can be combined. Yeah. And, and Didi, I don't have time anymore. I know Victor is a better negotiator than I am. He has taken um, Oscar, not Victor. Sorry, Oscar, you were the one you were ne negotiating <laughs> the time better than I. Um, so do you allow me 30 seconds more or shall I just come back later? Let's let's take this as an end then. It, actually, you raise a very important point and I'm going to call on Clem to underline that um, point um, simply because you talk about the importance of boards and that's the reason why we're here. That's the reason why we're partnering with the Institute of Directors um, who have 4,000 members, pretty much all of whom are board directors. How do we influence this? from the boardroom? And how do we actually put this into the boardroom as a core issue? Dota, thank you very much for that challenge and for that question, because that's the only way to sustain environmental and social impact, actually, to develop a real culture of sustainability. Um, Clem, over to you. Is Clement still here? I think we might have lost him. No, I'm here, but I didn't quite get your last comment. The network was not stable. Could you please repeat? So, so the question was really, how do you, and it Alan, really is a question that- Alan, Didi, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, but I think you faded off. My internet wasn't stable. I didn't, I didn't get your comment. Okay. My question was centered around coming from the corporate sector. I'm asking literally Dirta's question, which is how do you actually, and then we're gonna pass it back to Dirta, and then we're gonna to work towards the end and everybody's going to make their closing statement. How do you actually engage the boards? How do you make sustainability a core issue in the boardroom? Can boards drive sustainability and the operationalization of sustainability and circularity for impact in the society on a social environmental level? Thanks. I think, you know, the simple answer is that the board is key, you know, to driving this in companies because they set the targets, they set the goals. And of course, you know, they set the expectations, you know, and the bottom line expectations and the top line expectations. So I actually think that this, you know, should start from the boardroom and not necessarily from the management. Uh, I think I was lucky to work for a global company that understood the imperative of this. And so you had, you know, the global strategy being embedded or sustainability being embedded in the global strategy. And therefore, it was a lot easier, you know, whether the market level or the regional level, you know, for you to run and, uh, you know, drive, you know, those objectives. But of course, there are certain times, you know, when the budget conversations become very difficult. I mean, you start the year very hopeful that you've got X, you know, to implement what you have to do, you know, for sustainability. But then why happens in the middle of the year? And then it becomes a question of, you know, what is more imperative? Is it, you know, um, the work that you've got to do or is it keeping the company whole? So those questions come in from time to time. And I think that it's about, you know, um, the board deciding on what is the priority or more appropriately, what is the balance, you know, between the bottom line expectation and, you know, the top line expectation. And I think achieving that balance is critical. And I think there is also a role for stakeholders, I mean, sorry, for shareholder groups, okay, to understand the fact that the pressure on companies to grow at X rate or to deliver X level of returns can be very injurious, you know, to the collective aspiration to build a sustainable world. I was reading an article about a year or two ago that talked about, you know, 
the challenges of corporate greed. And I think we all are very familiar with that phrase, even though people use it in different contexts. So I think it's important to begin to moderate those expectations because the truth of the matter is, as we talk about secular economy, we're talking about cutting down on the consumption of resources. But then when you see the level of bullish targets that companies set year on year for growth, you know, it kind of like sounds counterintuitive. Okay, we want to preserve the planet. We want to, you know, use less of resources. But everyone wants to achieve a triple-digit growth. Okay, and sometimes, you know, it's you know there is that disconnect. So I think, you know, setting those kind of expectations, you know, is what the board does, and therefore that conversation has to start from there. And I think beyond the board also, perhaps that is where, you know, some, you know, kind of regulatory, you know, impact should come in. And here, I know I'm going to be very controversial when I'm saying that. How do we check, you know, the appetite for growth, you know, some of which, you know, is not quite aligned, you know, to the objective of either, you know, slowing down, you know, the carbon footprint or slowing down, you know, the rate at which, you know, resources are depleted. But then again, the second aspect apart from growth is also, you know, the delivery of returns. And companies need to decide, do I want to, you know, win in the short term by delivering my short term bottom line aspirations? Or do I want to invest in the long term and create opportunities that then enables us as businesses and the society to flourish? You know, unfortunately, these are not decisions that management you know, can take. These are not decisions that managers can take. I think these are decisions that need to be cracked at the board level. And therefore, I think there is a lot of responsibility on the board to set the right tone and create that you know, environment within which those who run the businesses can actually make decisions that are sustainable and decisions that promote you know the sustainability that we are all you know inclined to 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 to, to pursue thank you so much for that response which actually speaks to ayatollah's ayatollah jagun's question about how we encourage the board to take esg issues seriously when there is so much pressure on the companies she talks about unstable political and an economic environment and also obviously the big issue of, of corruption. And, and that substantiates what you've talked about in terms of these growth, 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 high growth targets that companies are subjected to. We've actually come to the end of this round and we've got one last salvo going through um, of last liners. I'm gonna start with you, Dörte, um, because I know you have 30 seconds. I will actually give you more than that. I'll give you 75 seconds um, to make a closing statement. Okay, thank you. Wow. Now you put pressure on me. Um, my closing statement is, yeah, let's get ownership by um, directors and the executives. I think it the whole journey starts there. Yeah, They can, of course, then delegate and they must delegate. It's fine. But without them, you won't achieve anything, right? Now, to have board and the executives convinced, I talked about what kind of impact you can reach for your organization. I think that is fine. Now the question is, what are the tools, right, to get there? And what are the tools for the journey? You use the seven pillar approach or other approaches. And um, what are the, the tools? And I, you know, I like to imagine you a, a temple, actually, you know, the simple temple structure where the roof is built by the directors and the executives. And what you want to reach is a fundament where the entire institution carries this through a very solid corporate culture. Yeah, it's a, sustain, a sustainability oriented corporate culture. And what you have are pillars, four pillars, I believe. The first one is you need to bring in sustainability in your processes in the business processes, but also in your risk management processes, in your HR processes. So the process pillar is super important that you translate your mission and vision into processes. And I'm pretty sure that if I look at um, the companies represented here in almost all the companies, the mission statement talks about sustainability in the one or other way. <laughs> so translate it in your processes. The next pillar is data. Yeah, you will need data to prove your case. Yeah, so at a relatively early stage, I believe you need to take the time in your journey to identify and to define what are the data in your company that speak to your sustainability goals. It will be important also to reach the impact I talked about earlier, 
um, you will have to report and you will hope for an ESG rating yeah, that proves your sustainability strategy right. The third very important pillar to me is communication. Communication, communication, communication. And that means communication inside. So you need your marketing or communication department to help to talk to stuff. You need a very credible communication strategy. And of course, you need to communicate to the outside. Yeah? You need to get in partners. You need to talk to your regulators, to um, the public sector, et cetera, et cetera, the communication pillar. And the last pillar, which I think might not be at the beginning of the journey, but it's an important one too, it's about projects. Yeah? Most of corporates have corporate sustainability. Yeah. Bring them in, don't leave them out. Some are connected to be able to say, oh, we have CSR activities. No, bring them into your temple. Build these projects, seek partnerships, yeah? and make sure that your corporate sustain um, CSR activities are part of your entire temple and business strategy. 75 seconds. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And I think those four pillars are very interesting. I'm going to hand right over to um, Eunice. Eunice, I mean, would you like to build on that in terms of giving advice in the, your closing line? So we've heard process, data, communication, and also, um, gosh, which one am I missing? Dota, what did I miss? Your favorite one, the project. The project, exactly, exactly. Impact, impact. That's the impact word. Okay, brilliant. Eunice, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Andede. Um, making sustainability a board meeting agenda uh, requires um, making a strong business case for it. Uh, like I said earlier, one of the factors that drives sustainability in streaming in businesses is that wrong impression that ESG is a cost center that can wait. Um, I think it is important that the board is made to see that the future of the business actually lies with how responsibly and uh, sustainably that business is managed. Uh, for example, best ESG practices, you know, like you and I know, helps businesses to drastically reduce costs in the long run. Uh, it also helps the business to build a strong reputational capital that secures its market share. Um, it's, it, it, of course, helps the business to garner investors and customers' loyalty and uh, sustain a strong market share and uh, sustainable profits. And of course, uh, it, you know, it, it keeps the businesses out of trouble, uh, including bad publicity and punitive fines, you know, that could result from non-compliance with the relevant uh, ESG related regulations. I do think that once the board clearly understands this strong influence that uh, uh, ESG actually wields over the business, then gradually, you know, it becomes a permanent agenda uh, in board meetings. Thank you very much, Eunice. Perfect timing. And we have four more closing statements, each of 30 seconds. Um, I'll start with you, Amaka. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. A lot already has been said that we know that the ESG really needs to start from the boardroom. So I just want to ask my key learnings in terms of how this is a great tool to minimize regulatory or legal interventions. It also increases employee productivity. We've seen it that it's a great tool that also minimizes a lot of um, maybe punitive taxes uh, or the way uh, and also builds strong brand love and reputational goodwill and corporate value to the company. It helps you in the times of crisis because the communities and everyone kind of love you and they are able to protect your assets in times of crisis, which saw that happen during the NSAS protest in Nigeria and is a great tool for organizations to win the love of the various communities where they operate. So I will end it at that so that we can actually see that it is actually a positive to the business rather than seeing it as a cost driver. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much, Amaka. You exceeded your 30 seconds. You did 55, I'm counting. <laughs> okay. Over to you. <laughs> OK. The work, we, the work we do at FBRA is to uh, enhance the self-sustaining recycling industry in Nigeria. This can be done through innovation, 
wealth creation, and to stimulate employment. It is impact driven, it's beyond CSR. So companies have to go beyond CSR to ensure that projects that are done have social, environmental, and economic impact. Uh, just like the keynote speaker said, I have to manage my 30 minutes. Uh, this is the decade of action. How can we take these conversations further? We can do that in three ways. First, we need to continue to invest in research and development. There are a lot of initiatives and applications that um, the packaging material, for example, can be used for. How can we adapt them to suit our current um, country and our current situation? Secondly, how do we scale up solutions to make sure they are sustainable over time? There are different solutions that are happening in silos. How can we scale that up? And lastly, I want to re-emphasize what we started with, collaboration. Collaboration is key. Collaboration between the private sector, the public sector, and all relevant stakeholders in order for us to drive the circular economy and sustainability forward. So it's not just about reporting alone, but it's about having great impact and that can be achieved greatly through collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arase. Very well put, very well said. So over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll try and use my 30 seconds well. I, I will end um, from where we started. And this is about collective action and, um, and, the, and the power in partnerships. And uh, I will use a very well used African proverb that says, if you want to go far, you walk alone. But if you want to um, go, if you want to go fast, you walk alone. But if you want to go far, you walk together. And for me, that is very important, beginning from the internal. And so looking from the board, from senior management, from employees, uh, from our value chain partners uh, to the externals. And this includes platforms like the UN Global Compact, the local network, the IOD, um, various platforms uh, uh, available to work together because we can achieve a lot more uh, as businesses, we can tell our stories, but I think the collective story uh, from a national perspective, from a continental perspective, will make greater impact. And uh, I believe that it also helps us um, be uh, self-accountable and also there's a peer accountability. Uh, so I believe there's a lot of value to be derived from a consistent and deliberate collective action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Otto. Uh, Clem, you close for us. I think, you know, a lot of uh, focus and a lot of pressure appears to be on corporates, but I think we need to recognize the fact that, you know, this is not something for the corporate bodies alone. I think everyone has a role to play. If we look at where Europe and some of the advanced uh, economies are, where, you know, the ESG and sustainability, you know, are far more, you know, advanced in terms of impact and in terms of, uh, number of companies and how companies comply or rather companies adopt it. It's because, you know, the environment was created for companies, you know, to act. And so I think that there is need for, you know, consumer activism, for citizen activism, and even for governments, you know, to strengthen their own regulatory capacity, both in terms of developing the frameworks that can encourage companies to do what is needed and also the capacity to enforce those. I mean, we don't like those in Nigeria. We've got the EPR, we've got a whole lot of things, but I think it's important that everyone, you know, weighs in their voice and brings in, you know, whatever capacity they have to ensure that everyone, not just the corporate bodies, are able to do what is required to ensure that Africa can make progress and take advantage of the immense opportunities that have been outlined that lie both in sustainability and in ESG reporting. Thanks. Thank you so much, Clement. That's a great note to close. Um, if I can just ask everybody to mute um, again, <clears throat> we're going to be taking the keynote address. I want to thank all my panelists. You know yourselves, as we like to say. I'm not going to call you by name. You've just all been so awesome and so educated. Please take time to look at the Q&A. Please answer some of the questions that were there. Clem, there was a particular um, comment uh, for you, compliment, but also a question. And regarding the last question from Bayo Ayoade, we will take that when we go into the next panel, which is the investor panel, which will be taken by, we'll start with a keynote by Patrick Kuboya, Kabuyo, Kab Kaboya. And um, what I can say is that we're four minutes behind schedule. 
Um, Patrick, would you like to already project if you are projecting with slides? If you would like to project already, that would be great. Um, and he is the convener of the Africa Integrated Reporting Council, also works with the World Bank. I, I've heard him speak before severally. I've been on panels with him. He's always very engaging. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Dindi, for the invitation and to all protocols observed. Jumbo, my, grand, my mother, always, I always tell people I'm from Kenya, but live in South Africa. But I always like teaching people how to say greetings in our country. We say Jumbo and you just respond Jumbo. But on behalf of the Africa Integrated Reporting Council, on behalf of the World Bank, I thank you for the honor to participate and present in this event. And Dr. Didi, I think I've shared my slides and I hope my colleague whoever is presenting is going to reflect on them. I'm going to speak on three issues and majority of these are information which have already been shared, but it's important to re-emphasize and note them for your benefit. But firstly is on the why. Many people as we move up around in the Africa region, we get asked, why is this topic important? Yes, we've addressed a lot of those issues today, but I just want to, to hone on them. And here I'm focusing mainly on sustainability reporting and integrated reporting. Then the what, what's critical. And finally, on the how. And I'll be sharing those points from the World Bank perspective, the experiences and the observations of what you've seen in the World Bank and the work that we are currently doing at the Africa Integrated Reporting Council. And for your benefit, the Africa Integrated Reporting Council is an initiative by two institutions, the World Bank, and the second one is called the Pan-African Federation of Accountants. This represents 55 professional accountancy bodies. ICANN and ANAN are part of them from the 44 countries. So without waste further ado, the why, and some of the messages I'm repeating, I'm going to be repeating them, but it's always good. I've been told the more you hear a message, the easier it becomes for you to remember tomorrow. So there are three reasons I want to focus on. Why is this topic become very important? There are many reasons, but let's repeat some. One is the point raised earlier on. There is increased need for organization to consider the three elements of sustainable development. We're calling them environment, society, and the economy, or planet, people, and profit. And those have, the company has an impact on them, or the organization has an impact on them. And why is the three elements critical? We agreed there is increased need to achieve the sustainable development goals. We all know about that. And what that means, is most of our organizations, and I particularly speak about Africa region, need to shift from only focusing on the economy, the profit, and bring in those other two elements. Most of our colleagues today talked about the COVID-19 pandemic. It has elevated the needs and the importance of the society. A lot of contribution from the businesses to the COVID-19 funds. And we can't ignore the big topic, the big elephant in the room, the climate change has impact in our organization, physical transitional risk, and also the organizations are, have impact on the climate change. And it's important to be undertaking some of those notions on how do we in consider, integrate, and report on the climate change aspects in our own e economies. And the same on the three elements is also the investor side. And we heard very well from the Nigeria Stock Exchange, the investors today are more interested with those organizations that are sustainable and are considering the three elements of sustainable development goals. And it's becoming clear, if you see the data, that the ESG funds are more attractive and there is more funds going to those ESG funds. So we as the board members, and I guess I'm speaking to major, a number of you today, is how do we mindfully increase those three elements within our operations? And the second of this is the shift from shareholder-centric to stakeholder-centric model. What do I mean? Majority of us went and learned, and even today you may hear that a company exists to create value for the wealth for the shareholders, driven by profit, share price, and dividends. And this is no more. Most of our different stakeholders today have changed, and we have had some of the statements alluded today. The society, the community, and the civil societies are demanding different things from the organizations which are not taking into account the impact on the society environment. I'm seeing in South Africa where I live, the annual general meetings, 
the civil society organization are asking companies, why is there no resolution on climate change? I'm seeing customers in many countries sending a tweet when they are not happy about a product and that has a reputation of damage on an organization. Youth are more interested in organizations which are doing greater good or good corporate citizenship other than those which are only focused on profits and employees at large. So there's that greater shift from just shareholders to stakeholders and we need to increasingly take this into account. And when I think about the Africa region, this is of particular importance for us, that the organizations operating within the Africa region need to mindfully say, how do we create value, not just for our shareholders, but create value using the enormous resources we have in Africa for the benefit of all the Africans, for the benefit of Nigerians, creating the youth, the just 60% of the population in Africa, and that's critical. And the third DD and participant most important area of why sustainability has become important is it's no longer financials. Uh, there is a study done by a, a group called the Ocean Mortal, which compared the 500 uh, S&P listed organization. And in 2015, they said, if you look at the market value of those companies, only, and you compare that with the additives in the balance sheet, the balance sheet only makes 20% of the market value of a company. And it may be good exercise to check also the listed companies in Nigeria Stock Exchange. So we are ignoring 80% of the value of the organization. We are not auditing 80% of the organization. We are not telling people about the 80% of the organization. And that becomes critical on how we bring that on board. And these are the other intangibles that are brought around by the sustainability. It's the other capitals behind financial that we need to bring on board. So the today's financial statements are not bringing all this information. The investors are looking for it and we need to increasingly change to sustainability, which will in introduce these elements. So the second part is what do we need to do? And in the what, yes, we've talked about, about sustainability reporting, but I think the first one, and it has been alluded to briefly, is on integrated thinking concept. This is the heart of this agenda. This involves how the board and senior management include the six capitals, includes the three elements of sustainable development in the business models, in the functions and the department so they create long-term value for the benefit of everyone else. And that notion becomes the DNA. Most of us talked about this. It's the system thinking within the organization. It's how you change the culture of the organization so that that can flow down on the integrated thinking approach. But secondly, is on the functions. So the functions within the organization needs to work closely, all the departments, all the agencies, so that we can create this long-term value that increases benefits for all our stakeholders. And I think this is an important fact. It's not just about the, the reporting, but also the function. And then the final one is on the integrated reporting itself. Yesterday, we are talking a lot about sustainability, but many users are telling us that the financial statement and preparing a separate sustainability reports are too complex, are backward looking, are too long, and the story is being lost in the meaning. They are not understanding it. And remember this, so they are not understanding. Remember this, to be accountable, the board needs to issue information that's understandable. And I repeat, to be accountable, the board needs to issue information which is understandable. And if you are not then issuing information which is understandable, then we need to question our accountability. So there's increasing need to consolidate and integrate these two reports. And this is where the issue of integrated reporting becomes important. A concise report focusing on material issues on how the organization is creating value. And I know Nigeria is, some of the institutions in Nigeria are using integrated and I hope we'll move from sustainability, merge with financial, so we can have an integrated report that tells the story. Who is a company? Where are we going? and what, what are we dealing with it? And the element of auditing this information becomes important. And that's a good conversation that we also need to hold and think whether we have the capacity. And then finally, how do we do about this? So our emphasis has been on three levels. One is at the organization level. And some of these things have been alluded to. So at the board level, and I'm speaking to a number of board members today, firstly, an organization should put in place the appropriate structures to increasingly consider environment in particular and society issues 
both in your governance arrangements, in the business models, in the strategy and operations, risk management becomes important, and also in the reporting arrangements. So you can't ignore the reporting arrangements. And remember this, and I want to emphasize this, this is a governance reform. It's not a reporting reform because that's where we are getting it wrong. And a number of colleagues did to allude to this earlier. So this is a governance reform, not a reporting reform. So we as the board, and I think some of the colleagues alluded to this a lot, we need to spend more time, not just on the financials, but on the three elements of, of sustainability, economy, environment, and society. And some quick questions I may need to ask to you today is, you need to be asking yourself, how are you reimagining your organization strategy to include these three elements, especially environment and society? Are you taking that into account as a board member? How are you adapting your board meetings? Does your board strategy include these issues? Does your board agenda, sorry, is stakeholder management a critical aspect in your board meetings? Because this is an important issue. Is climate change something you speak about a lot? How are you adopting your risk management? So I think these are questions that we need to be asking more and more of within our board meetings and, and increasingly incorporate them. Then the second, how are we, do we have appropriate knowledge and skills at the board level to discuss these issues? Because this is critical. And I find that in some of the board is, do we even know the Nigeria climate change commitments? Someone is speaking. Sorry, just mute you, Roman. And all the targets in the country. Do we know the, our sector targets on climate change? Because that becomes... So I think that we have lost you um, there. Sorry, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. And I'm going to give you okay, 30 fine. seconds to round up. Fine. Yes, fine. So that's what I'm saying. Those are questions you need to start asking more and more about in the board on how mindfully you include this. And then at the country, it's good that you already have the Nigeria Integrated Reporting Committee. And hopefully that can help with the partnership to advocate, to speak a lot about this agenda within the country and also think about which reform or instruments can we use to adopt this reform. Uh, we obviously have the corporate code of governance, but maybe more need to be done to be more mindful oriented other than a tick box. And then from the Africa, it's good to tell you that we are also trying to develop capacity from our committee that would help an institution like Nigeria. We're trying to help to bring this in the universities program. So South Africa, as an example, has a chief value officer program at the universities and some of these initiatives may end up benefiting you at large and we'll share more and more of this. So include to drive this agenda. So at the end, I invite and I encourage all of you to at your organization, at country level, at regional level to think on how we can drive this agenda in Africa region because it's important for Nigerians and it's important for, for the Africans at large to achieve the agenda of Africa 2063. And with that, my final slide is just on Nelson Mandela. If we, if, what counts in life is not mere fact that we have lived, it's about the difference we make in life of others. So it's up to us participating today to change this reform. If it's not us, then who? And if it's not now, then who else is going to do this for us? Asante Sana. Asante Sana, Patrick. Thank you so much. I see that you are all about equity. And so the last keynote was 13 and you're 13 and you've done a brilliant, um job at introducing this panel and i'm going to ask all the panelists to put on their cameras um patrick i'm presuming that you will stay for this panel i'm very glad that you will because i will have a question that comes back to you um we're going to go through the salvo i think the easiest thing is i've sent you all the first question i would like to ask the moderator to please make sure i can get omobolanle lanio onto the panel because i can't see her um just yet and um, Kola, I'm going to start with you. Um, first minute, first minute, and first six, 60 seconds are intro, but also the question of how do we integrate sustainability into your investment criteria, and how does this positively impact economic resilience, particularly SMEs? It's one of the questions that is in the Q and A chat. Welcome. Fantastic. Thanks, Ndidi, for uh, 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 having me on this panel. It's a delight to, to join this the group of people speaking here today. Uh, my name is Kola Ino, and I'm general partner at Ventures Platform. 
Uh, we are an early stage discovery fund. Uh, we invest primarily in what we like to describe as market creating innovations that we believe are the future of, 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 of the continent. Um, we are quite broadly invested across the early stage investing space with a portfolio of about, uh, about 45 companies across various verticals. And uh, you know, we started off as a, as a proprietary fund and then uh, uh, grew into uh, you know, uh, having LPs that are primarily uh, private individuals and HNIs. But from the get-go, we always viewed ESG as very important and included ESG, the principles of ESG in, as a part of our DD process. Uh, and as a part of uh, the action plans we put in place once a portfolio company is being onboarded. You know, in, in hindsight, uh, it looks like we, we, we doing that was, was, was a good call. Uh, because as we've expanded our, our fund size and we now are raising capital from institutional LPs, it, it is now no longer a, a personal choice, but a requirement. And to that, we say uh, thank you, because ultimately, we believe that the companies we back today are ultimately going to be the unicorns of the continent. And so, and generally speaking, we are of the opinion that it is generally always difficult for a company to adopt these principles as they get when they get really big. And so what we want to do is work with the companies at the earliest stages to develop action plans that sometimes find their way into our, into our uh, side notes and investment agreements uh, with established milestones of how, how a, a, a early stage company can progressively develop uh, the right policies and business models that really take into cognizant the impact of their business on the environment. And so I'll be very happy to expand a little bit more on what that means in practical, in practical terms, but thanks for having me. Brilliant, Carla. Early stage investing is so important. Angel investing is so important. Thank you so much for putting your money where your mouth is. Um, with that, I'm going to hand over to Bolanli, who is representative of a real change agent within one of the largest banks and ask the same question regarding ESG as investment criteria and impact on the um, real sector, SMEs in particular, and also a self intro. The same will apply for all. Okay, thank you very much, Inditi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad and excited to, to be a part of this um, um, session. My name is Omo Bolanli Victor Lanio. I work currently as head of sustainability at Access Bank. Um, for us at Access Bank, really, it's um, about our commitment to responsible business practices. And so, um, in terms of um, ESG integration into um, our business, this is something that we've been doing for well um, over a decade um, and we've invested in um, developing both in-house and um, also purchasing um, various toolkits that enable us to ensure that um, we embed ESG criteria into um, screening processes for every um, facility, every loan um, that we give as a bank. Um, so um, that entire process and the categorization of, you know, the various um, um, loans. We also, um, as a way of um, forging our commitment on this front, um, we've done, we've undergone a process of greening our books such that um, we now have a, a set of um, green um, loan book and encouraging investment, um, encouraging organizations to, um, to invest and to, and to play in a cleaner space, cleaner in terms of social issues, in terms of environmental issues and also around the governance of what they do. Um, as we invest our funds as well in um, organizations, we also have 
um, local and international organizations that have invested in us. And um, one clear um, area of interest um, for these um, investors has been our ESG commitment and ESG performance. So this is something that we take very seriously. And I think that that's also informed us um, issuing um, the first um, climate bond um, initiative certified green bond um, in, in Africa and the first corporate green bond in Nigeria. But I think that aside from that um, is the fact that um, we understand that even with um, the recent um, issues around COVID-19, um, we understand that there needs to be a sharper focus on the S in the ESG, um, which is something that we currently are putting um, efforts into and working on. Um, we, for us, ESG investing um, um, enables us focus on making, you know, an active effort to limit negative impact directly and indirectly, directly meaning um, for our own um, business processes and indirectly meaning for um, the processes and operations of our um, clients base. Excellent. And um, this, this, this really is characterized by direct connection between value-based priorities um, and the use of our investors capital. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mobile and Nate. So I think what you've done is you've started the salvo into the next phase, and we're wandering our way through the first minute right now. I have Jarrett, who comes at this more from an asset management um, perspective. Um, I have Folashade, who speaks from a large corporate, but also from an angel investment um, perspective. And we have Benedict and Richard, who come at it as well from a fund manager, fund manager investing and ESG rating and risk management point of view. Um, again, please introduce yourselves and please speak to how actually ESG and sustainability um, data helps us to build more resilient businesses, especially SMEs and growing businesses um, in the economy. Um, Jared, I'm gonna ask you to take this next. Sure. Uh, thank you, Ndidi, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Uh, hopefully I can provide some interesting color from a European institutional investor perspective. Uh, so quickly about me, my name is Jared Letterhoff. I work for Aegon Asset Management. I'm based in the Netherlands. Um, it's part of the Global Aegon Group, which is a company that does a lot of work with insurance and pensions, um, primarily in the Netherlands, the UK, and the US. But we also have operations and partnerships in places like China and things. Um, I generally support clients most of the time in developing and enhancing and implementing policies, um, investment policies, RI policies and ESG policies, as well as helping to advise on um, ESG and sustainability aspects in our investments. So really, for what, what do we look at with ESG and all this sort of stuff for us, um, ESG sustainability reporting really starts from a place of governance and transparency. Uh, when we look at evaluating investments, um, these sorts of th factors are absolutely critical for us. Um, you know, I think institutional investors are actually rather timid uh, shy, you know, they're actually really risk adverse. Um, so this sort of attention to ESG um, from companies gives us uh, gives us more confidence, like it helps us to build more confidence in the investment decisions we're making. Um, so, you know, things like stronger disclosures make us feel more strongly that there's good governance in place. Uh, it makes us feel more strongly and more faith in the actions and the decisions that the management is taking. Um, you know, and when we see things like target sustainability indicators, you know, Patrick mentioned earlier at the, the keynote that things that are concise and material, when we see that sort of targeted sustainability, targeted ESG disclosures, we really feel that that's part of the business, which then makes us feel even more confident. You know, we think we're working with and looking at a stronger company. So that helps us really makes us feel a lot better in that. Um, and I should say, you know, not every indicator, of course, is important. You know, we don't need everything in the kitchen sink in, in your report. You know, it's all about focusing on what is relevant and material for the business, whether it's E, S, 
well, G I think is important for everybody, but definitely E and S factors, depending on your industry, uh, your business um, and where you work, right? And then what we also look for is that these are done in line with local and international disclosure guidance, right? There's wonderful guidance and the sustainability pillars you're speaking about earlier, uh, the development of reporting guidance, all that sort of stuff is really, really helpful because when we can see that direct connection, we know that you're responding to what stakeholders, what shareholders, what investors are looking for, which is really great. And that helps us kind of build a, a good picture of the business and helps us understand the ESG impacts and performance and helps us make much more confident and comfortable investment decisions. Brilliant. Jared, that was really concise and very, very helpful because the objective of this workshop and the reason why IOD has been so persistent and keen for us to hold it is because we're trying to help companies actually know what to do and how to do this. And we're sharing, I'm so grateful that you're all sharing of your wealth of expertise. Richard, one of the questions is how. So we know what Jarrett needs, but how do we actually deliver that? Can you give us a little bit of insight? And yeah, well, just a little bit about me first. I'm the CEO of Amex. So we're a specialist in providing systems and advice actually to companies in implementing systems to help them. I guess what you could really describe it as is to manage sustainability. So there's it's twofold. It's understanding what they want to do. So they have to define an objective and then putting in systems to help them manage performance, much like you do with any other business function, whether it's selling or whether it's um, finance, you need data to manage performance. So what we do is we work with businesses of all shapes and sizes. In recent years, referring to the last sessions that we had, in recent years, there's been a huge influx of, uh, in terms of orders into our order book, in terms of people needing systems. It's firstly come from the larger companies, but it's now cascading down to smaller and smaller companies. But the first thing we do with any company is look at where they are. And this is a journey and it's very, very important to, I think for companies to bear this in mind, it's not something where you go in and you start doing your GRI reporting. And I think going back to Jared's point, you know, investors aren't expecting that. We're working with people like Apex Partners and others in the UK, but they're not expecting you to have it right at the get-go. And what people want to see, it's a direction of travel. I like to see ESG itself as something that's helping to bring a bit of equity and fairness into the game. You know, at the end of the day, a lot of investors are really the people who work in the businesses because investors are pension funds, you, the employees in terms of people, they're the investors in the pension funds, et cetera. But what we're really seeing is this migration towards a fairer world because we're, we're now observing that happy, engaged workforces, happy, engaged suppliers, customers, et cetera, leads to better business and better longevity for every, everybody. It also means you're thinking about things outside of the box. You're not kind of dirtying the river. You're not messing with the climate. You're thinking about everybody. And that's, that's the great thing, thing about ESG. So what, we, what we're seeing is companies getting more and more engaged, but I would be very, very clear about this, that a lot of companies need to just not try and do everything at once. So if it's new to you, start off with something small, look at your direction of travel and get it right over two to five years. But when you are doing, when you are entering the ESG journey, and I think most people are on it, whether they're, but whether they're on it properly or not, but they're doing something, whether it's not observing good ESG practice or doing it, let's say they're just on it, but it's about taking small steps, working, putting systems in place, and then measuring things against the step. This is what I want to do. This is where I got to. This is what I'm going to do next. It comes back to the whole John Durr school. It's measure what matters. You know, it's like running a set of OKRs. You have got to really say, there's my objective and here's the key results to hit them. And it's about aligning the organization. And ESG is really about aligning organizations, aligning employees, aligning investors, customers, suppliers. And it's achieving that alignment and using systems to do that that really drives out the value. And the value is there, it's a shared value that everyone gets in the end. Beautiful. Um, I think we have a PowerPoint slide up. It's not time yeah. for that, it's still on the panel. Um, we are looking forward to that presentation, but it's not yet time. Okay, and I think we are good in time. Richard, thank you very much. That was very insightful. Um, for Lashade, um, I mean, we just heard also there's a, a question and we heard a comment about aligning 
the employees, the corporation, and the value chain. Um, and you have done quite a bit in that regard in your corporate role, but you're also investing in value chain actors. Would you like to introduce yourself and speak a little bit to that, please? Okay, yes, uh, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleased to be here. Um, thank you to um, IOD and fellow IOD members. Um, my name is Fola. I'm Bruce Mirabem. I wear a number of hats, as stated. I currently lead um, the sustainability, communication, and public affairs function for Lafarge Africa, which is a subsidiary of Lafarge Holson. I also serve on the UN uh, Global Compact Nigeria Board and um, wear another hat as the World Business Angels Senator representing Nigeria. I'm, I'm also an angel investor. So um, that's the hat uh, I'm wearing today. And back to your, your question, Indidi, um, it's really a question that we always, one tends to ask oneself really is that, you know, as an investor, is this business sustainable? Um, and when you're thinking about sustain a sustainable business, it's about asking whether that, uh, you know, business can deliver financial returns in the short or long term. Does it generate value for society and does it obviously operate within the environmental constraints? Essentially, this is what uh, and where sustainability plays. Um, facts such as, um, um, you know, water scarcity, natural resource constraints, climate change. I mean, today's Earth Day, we all know about that. Labor conditions, as you just mentioned in the supply chain, are, are factors that do you know, impact businesses. So the quick, you know, the key, you know, core business question is really, is how are they finding ways to address and respond to these sustainability trends? Um, and how indeed are they incorporating it into their business model and strategy? And clearly there's a win-win factor there for everyone as well, because once that can be done, it enables competitive advantage. Competitive advantage, again, is something that uh, investors are looking for. Um, generation of growth opportunities, um, reduction of costs, again, these are good uh, indicators and effective management of risks. Um, when you're talking about um, the evolution of, of you know, the landscape ESG risks in a company, it does obviously affect their, their um, ability to survive. Um, investors nowadays are no, long, no longer just looking at what um, you do to make profit, um, but they're more or less focusing on how um, you make this profit as well. And so um, that's why you have the likes. And I heard a few of the fellow um, previous panelists allude to the you know, ESG rating agencies. And um, you know, we, for instance, at Lafarge Holcim um, work with Sustainalytics and um, they essentially are measuring the environment, the ESG um, ex company's exposure you know, to risks. And um, if you think about it over the last five years, I think the world um, uh, report, I can't remember what report it was, identify climate change as one of the biggest, um, biggest, uh, you know, risks to business. So, you know, from, from an investor um, standpoint, it's really, uh, you know, for, important for the CEOs, CFOs, and in fact, other business leaders to really be asking themselves, you know, how are sustainability issues um, sort of impacting the business or their business? Have they conducted that a diagnostic you know, to assess the level of, of ESG risks. And, um, you know, obviously all very, very, you know, sound organizations should have a, you know, very robust enterprise risk management system. So how are the two interconnected and working, you know, together? So these are just some of the um, points that I wanted to, to mention. And clearly for us at uh, Lafarge, it's uh, totally indoctrinated into our entire, you know, operational system. The fact that we have a chief sustainability officer for instance, um, we, who actually does sit on the board, and that board represents the 75 markets in which we operate. So that person is actually at the decision-making table. Um, we've integrated it in the fact that our annual report is now integrated. So we have the financial and the non-financial integrated. So that's a huge, huge uh, shift. And that also emphasizes the importance, back to my earlier opening, where I said it's about sustainable business. Um, when you're looking at value creation, um, corporate social responsibility, environmental performance, et cetera, et cetera, these are all some of those things um, that really do matter. And these are the indicators that typically um, ESG rating agencies are looking at, and likewise, the likes of myself and others who are investors. So I'll just stop there with uh, the opening. Thank you very much, Paula Shadi. That's brilliant. And you know that when I come back to you, I'm going to push you further in terms of how do we take this down? The, one of the first comments that was made was about youth. We have a, a huge teeming youth population, very innovative, very creative, and sustainability and circularity is about problem solving. 
So that's going to be the next salvo. Benedict, I know you have been very involved with the Circular Economy Innovation Partnership. And um, of course, as managing partner of Africa Kairos, I'm kind of putting you on the spot to start leading in terms of the how. You know, how do we um, um, take this initiative that's now being anchored by the IOD and Afrikairos to really create value out there. And don't forget, we're speaking from an investor's profile, which means people are out there listening. Over to you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for inviting and uh, happy to be here. And uh, of course, I think, of course, in Afrikairos, uh, we do uh, several things and we are deeply rooted in the uh, sustainability community. Uh, um, coming from Europe, but uh, since we are a matchmaker, we are uh, pretty much focused on Africa. Um, what, what I find uh, interesting is uh, two things and what we try to, uh, to set um, out in uh, Circular Lagos is uh, what Kola Aina said, uh, they're investing in the, in the unicorns and the future unicorns of, of the continent. And um, I think uh, if we look at circular economy or in general sustainable business models, sustainable in the in the sense of sustainability. I mean, every business model should be sustainable from a profitability point of view. But in, in general terms, if we look at the business models that are based on circular economy uh, um, principles, uh, those are uh, the ones that will make the difference in the future. And I think most of the businesses that, uh, that um, exist today and uh, don't realize that uh, they will be out of business in the future. So we talk about resilience a lot when we, when we look at investments. And of course, um, uh, resilience means that uh, I uh, try to tackle uh, challenges that I see uh, now or for our future life on this planet. And, and I think uh, companies who, who don't uh, take up these challenges, um, they will have problems in the future. And we also see that uh, not only and I think we can always put this in a positive or in a, in a more negative way coming from regulation. And uh, what I see is a big shift between uh, and uh, uh, before sustainability or ESG would be something that would be coming from the compliance uh, risk management uh, side of things. Uh, but we see more and more that it's coming actually from a business side of uh, things. And I think this is where it will gain even more traction. I think it is definitely a good thing to have more transparency. So not only to, uh, as an analyst, when you have to uh, uh, decide on an investment or not, to have more information, um, more indicators on how the, the investor target is behaving, how it's all the stakeholders around, is definitely helpful to understand if this is a, a worthwhile long-term investment that one can take. But in general terms, I think, uh, the sustainable or circular economy based business models are the ones uh, that will uh, give us most of the fun in, in the future uh, from an investor's perspective. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Benedict. So let's, let's deepen this. The fact is that we've already established now it's not a nice to have. We've heard from the investors that it actually matters. It makes a difference in terms of whether they will put their money down or they won't. In addition to that, we're actually facing a planetary emergency. In Nigeria particularly, we are facing not just a climate emergency, we're also facing a social crisis. There are not enough jobs for our young people. And the solutions that we can find for social, environmental and economic problems are potentially those things that will build our economy and drive our country forward. In fact, Nigeria is the engine for Africa. Question is, how do we do that? Especially when we look at it from an investment um, perspective. What can we do as investors across this broad tier? Um, Benedict, you also didn't talk about the fact that you did microfinance in Africa for 10 years. Um, you might want to talk about that in the next session. So I've got micro here and I've got all the way through early stage with Fola and Kola. I've also got um, large banking with Omobolanli and I have a practitioner also Fola and I have Richard who is working behind the scenes in terms of data and processes. So across the board, what can we do and what do we need individuals, SMEs, corporates, the supply chain and the value chain to do in order to address this 
emergency in a planetary and, and social context. Um, I'm going to start again with you, Kola. Yes, thank you. I, I think for us, we, we, you know, we, we really contextualize the environment in which, you know, we, we are investing in, like you said, um, the, you know, the social and security challenges we face in Nigeria today cannot be far removed from the impacts of climate change. I mean, if you think about deforestation and, and, and all of what we've been seeing with the farmer had a crisis. Um, and, and so as a necessity, uh, uh, we, um, we, 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 we have adopted uh, the ESG as a filter for, our, as a part of our DD process, uh, because, you know, again, if we must continue to sort of invest in this market and expect um, uh, uh, returns, then we must be mindful of, of, of the impact of the kinds of companies that we, we, we invest in. Um, it gets particularly interesting for us because at the stage at which we invest, very often, you know, if you if you know anything about early stage companies, you know that the last thing an early stage company is thinking about is governance, right? Um, and um, you know, uh, and when you know other investors are very quick to sign a term sheet or say for a note without asking any questions, you start to become, uh, you start to look like the old grandfather you know, uh, investor. Uh, but, you know, we, we think that um, there's actually significant alignments between uh, the, the founders that, that appreciate the value of, of these principles. And, and, and we will rather bet on those types of um, th th those companies. We, what, what we've also done um, and found some success in is really taking it a step further uh, beyond just using these principles as a part of our DD process and insisting on some of these, uh, on these principles being really adopted as policies by the companies as they mature in obviously in a progressive manner. Um, but, but it's really looking at the business models themselves to say, look, is there a way, is there value in really thinking through how your business model uh, can leverage um, um, uh, you know, ESG uh, uh, to its own benefit as well. And such that it doesn't become, it, it, it moves from being a nice to have, but as, as a multiplier of business outcomes. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, since we, you know, the companies we invest in are privately held, so there's really no regulatory requirement. Uh, but I think we've moved from looking at this as, as, um, as a nice to have to, 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 to a source of strategic advantage uh as it were uh plus you know tack on the fact that uh, as as um our lp pool starts to expand to include dfis and institutional investors it's really not a choice for us anymore um and so you know i think if if, if we have more uh, early stage investors and micro investors really uh adding on this extra layer of what might seem as an inconvenience uh, i i strongly believe that nigeria and the rest of africa would be better for it Thank you. Moving straight on, Omar Bolanle. Okay, thank you very much, Indidi. Um, and I think that um, this question is very valid. Um, earlier on, I'd mentioned the need, you know, to focus a bit more around the S in the ESG. And I think that this question, you know, gives me an opportunity to um, dwell a bit more into that. Um, so what do we need to do? The social issues are enormous. Given um, our operating environment in Africa, um, we bear the largest burden for, for the social issues. Um, what are we doing um, as a large financial institution? One is encouraging social investments, um, encouraging investments in critical areas um, that have to do with um, ensuring that the society is healthier and safer. So investments in health, in entrepreneurship, so building and encouraging entrepreneurs, um, on lending to um, 
microfinance institutions so that they can then you know lend to the um to those at the very uh, micro levels um, um, things are these all things that you're doing? You know, banks have the reputation of kind of being untouchable. So they don't have, so it'd be great. And that's why we chose you. If you actually were saying, you know, don't be so, don't be so high banks because they're making progress in that regard. So just to clarify, these are all things that are happening. Yes. So, so, um, and I'll just give them um, particular examples. So, with respect to health investments, um, would be an investment, for instance, in um, establishing and funding the HIV Trust Fund of Nigeria, um, working with government. Um, so PPP is one key area I wanted to mention um, when I started. Um, things around investment in primary health care. So we're currently um, working with a few other private sector organizations, um, including um, some banks and um, um, Dangote Foundation um, on the Adopt a Primary Healthcare Facility um, program, which will help us enable us um, ensure that we have a minimum of one standardized um, primary healthcare facility in each local government across Nigeria. Um, the hospital facility upgrade um, program that's done in partnership with um, GE to ensure that you know, um, local um, hospitals are able to address you know um, treatment issues and challenges um, once the um, facilities have been upgraded. So so we're working with them to get that done. Then also investments um, in gender. So gender investments. So um, from the WPAR loan. Um, to the various um, initiatives um, under the W um, initiative. So W initiative is a bouquet of all the various options um, that enable us as a bank invest in um, gender empowerment and um, gender issues. Um, also our investments in um, persons with disability because again, there are um, various segments of society when we speak to social issues that are being, you know, affected. And there are quite a number of them that are being ignored. Um, so not much is being done with respect to, to persons with disability and what that means, you know, um, for society and how, you know, some of this um, category of people are also now being used um, um, to negatively impact society. So we partnered with um, on Project Enable to establish um, the first inclus inclusion up for persons with disabilities and um, you know using that again to um, get them trained and part um, and establish them in business so those are things that are happening what are the things that are on the way or that that um, can also be done um, we're working on our social bonds um, which would encourage for that investment you know um, in social issues um, another key area, like I mentioned, um, is um, so public private. So, for example, what's what's happening at the moment? And then, and then I'm going to skip and and because I want to do one last round, and we're running out of time. So, in other words, given that you sit on quite a bit of capital, it means that the more innovative players, say the early stage investors or those creating bonds or funds, for instance, that are investing in the bottom of the pyramid, whether micro or SME, can yeah. actually with banks to actually address alternatives, not just financial oriented returns, but also impact returns. So from your perspective, yeah. impact investing is real. And back mm -hmm. to the question of um, partnerships, you would, for example, be partnering with the likes of, you know, other people around the table to create and bring to reality some of these funds so that more people can access capital from the real sector. Is that accurate and real? Is that really happening? Yes, that's happening. And those are the examples I've given. Brilliant. That's, 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 an important statement, and that's what I wanted to make sure that we got out there. Jarrett, from your perspective, I mean, a lot of the time, the companies um, on the African continent and in Nigeria in particular, they fall short. So when you do, for instance, your risk ratings, we spoke the other day about risk tails. What happens is 
you know, your rank companies in Nigeria down because you consider them to be a high ESG risk. What exactly is the problem there and how do we mitigate that? That's a good question. Um, yeah, it, it's, as I said, it's because institutional investors and things are, are quite shy. So they're very cautious when it comes to that. Um, and when we look at ESG, it's really, I think we talked the other day about it's a cultural expectation. There's a bit of a cultural difference there, where, which is what's expecting this, right? When we're looking at an emerging market like Nigeria, um, there's almost two different streams there to look at. Because one, if you're the subsidiary, a subsidiary of a multinational, you know, we've had people talk from, you know, Volshade herself from Lafarge and then other people from Coca-Cola and MTN, you know, those sorts of things. What we're looking for is, you know, because they have the ability to rely on the systems of the parent company, it's a bit unfortunate because it's just a big, it's just seen as a risk area, right? So we're just looking for things, what we call controversies, right? There's no, no bad news coming out of that, that system, no bad news coming out of that area. Um, but I think if, if it's a more local company, you know, if we're talking about someone like even like Access Bank, someone who's listed in a country like Nigeria, the expectations are a little bit different. Um, you know, we don't expect the same things. Um, we're looking for what we call momentum. You know, we're looking for changes over time. You know, have you, have you accepting the basis of this work? Are you building on that basis? Are you improving over time? Are you working towards greater disclosures? And I think that sort of thing is, is really helpful for us because that helps build that credibility. Uh, and as I said, so those, those, it's kind of almost two, two sides, right? Because one side, if you're, if you're part of a multinational, the expectations are higher and it's all risk mitigation. If you're local, uh, you know, local, um, yeah, I think there's great opportunities there in terms of growth. You know, we're looking for growth, we're looking for stability, we're looking for progress and recognition. Brilliant. And I'm going to ask um, Richard to follow through on that right away, um, and then we'll come to you for Lashade. Um, exactly. I mean, we've talked about it as a process, right? You need yeah, to and I, I just pick up what Jared is saying there. It's all around direction of travel. And this, again, goes back to the whole idea of, like, if you think about, like, when I think of emerging markets like Nigeria or any of the West African markets, I think direction of travel is the most important piece that people look at. That's really what everyone wants to see. The direction of travel is going in the right way and that it's being measured and directionally okay. So that's why I think people put systems in, but I think there's a fantastic opportunity for West Africa. You know, there's, it, it's growing. The population is growing. Yes, there is, as you say, there's, it's going through some turbulence socially, et cetera, but there is going to be growth. I think from an investor, an investor looking from the outside, the continent of Africa is due to grow and grow enormously. There's a lot more middle-class coming on stream. You know, expectations of these people are going to change of, of, of middle-class as they get there. Education systems are going to improve. So I think the narrative is fantastic. And I think if um, Nigeria and the other countries in West Africa really grab onto ESG, they have a fantastic value proposition for investors, external investors. like. The kind of things that they offer like is that they're growing they're filled with youth and people are excited about doing things and if they can share that enthusiasm for growth and excitement around it with investors and particularly external investors i've no doubt they'll get there and i see esg as a component of it and, you know directionally investors should be placing their money in there thank you so much richard for that very concise statement benedict actually i'm tempted to jump to you because you are looking at Africa and you've always been drawn to Africa and you're very passionate about ESG. Your father is the grandfather of one of the best ratings for ESG. Um, what do you have to say about the prospects for actually us leapfrogging with what appears to be an emergency, but could actually be a huge opportunity for us? You're on mute. Um, yeah, um, I think in my experience is that uh, uh, I've been uh, working in Africa uh, for quite some years. Then, then I went over to Latin America and then came back. And every time I come back to Africa, Africa is completely different. And that's uh, also right for Nigeria, the development, um, the evolution of the economy, and um, especially of the, the, the tech um, the ecosystems are, is so fast. And um, when you talk about leapfrogging, I think, I mean, we have mentioned it, um, 
uh, Richard uh, also mentioned the uh, uh, emerging middle class, but um, during my professional life, I've always looked at the bottom of the pyramid. And, and this is also where you have the masses of people. And what I always liked about uh, Africa is uh, that we uh, find solutions in Africa for problems that you will face in many places uh, on this planet, because you have to deal with uh, less more in, uh, less in infrastructure for uh, many, many, many more people. And uh, these tendencies we also see in other other countries, uh, industrialized nations where people are moving more into the cities and so on. And now we have uh, uh, technology. I mean, and, and you can develop technology that is um, easy to develop. It's relatively cheap. It's straightforward. We have access to education. So of course, this in an environment where you have uh, six and a half uh, million Nigerians leaving the university every year, um, that there is plenty of opportunity for investors, I think is clear. And uh, I'm looking definitely forward of seeing more innovation in the space that uh, actually makes the livelihood of those at the bottom of the pyramid uh, much better and also helps, uh, uh, gives opportunities to the ones uh, uh, who have not had these opportunities before um, to lift themselves out of uh, um, uh, the situation where they are in. And uh, so I'm totally excited about what we are seeing right now in Nigeria. And I think, um, of course, there's many problems to tackle and. Um, I think uh, more awareness in terms of sustainability or uh, stakeholder economy or stakeholder engagement uh, definitely helps in this sense to, to as Richard said, uh, uh, to make this a narrative that is uh, attractive to um, external investors as well. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Benedict. And, and that's a great way to um, survey over to you for La Chade. Um, because it's not just sustainability anymore, it's circularity. I was on a panel with Kola the other day um, for the Ali um, Talent Awards. And we both really loved this company that was making, well, this young man, he's in his early 20s, making shoes out of plastic, modular shoes, and benchmarking against Nike and Adidas and so on and so forth. And I mean, with the right level of investment and support, converting trash plastics into usable utensils is very real. And those are some of the investments that you've made. Um, what would you have to say about integrating circularity and sustainability into building real businesses that have the propensity to become global leaders? What do we need to do to make that real? Um, encourage you to invest in it would be the obvious answer to that. <laughs> um, I, I think um, this is a great, uh, um, opportunity to elaborate on the very premise of why the um, World Business Angel Forum exists. It's really about financial inclusion. It's about connecting you know, investors um, you know, with startups and trying to encourage them to scale up. Um, so yes, circularity um, is, is fundamentally important. Um, it's very important that uh, awareness and engagement uh, occurs. Collaboration is fundamentally important as well. I'm part of the team that is about to um, you know, establish the WBAF office in Nigeria where we can actually do that. And there's an actual academy that can also provide a lot of education and training in that regard. Um, at the end of the day, it's as uh, I think it was the Benedict that mentioned about uh, grassroots um, level and, and trying to make sure that a lot of that is actually being addressed. Um, personally, um, I invest a lot of that in, uh, of my money and a number of our, our investors also do that as well. The social dimension of it is very fundamentally important. Um, again, I think it's really important, not just looking at it on a minuscule scale, but also on a larger scale as well. So again, I, I elaborated and alluded to, to collaborating. So you have the likes of, um, you know, the obviously the Nigerian Stock Exchange, you have a number of other, the Lagos Chamber of Commerce, et cetera, et cetera. This is where, you know, collaboration is really, really important and understanding the stats and facts and understanding also, because it's not just about encouraging it, it's also about um, making sure that they are trained and well equipped because I'm not sentimental with money and I don't think any investor is. So it's really about making sure that what they are indeed um, trying to, to encourage or you know, grow from a, a circular economy standpoint, it does make sense. Um, I can give an illustrative example, um, GeoCycle, um, something that we are leading on in, across the 75 markets at Lafarge. What is GeoCycle? It's waste, turning waste into profits. I mean, it's also, um, for instance, we use that as well and link it to the reduction of CO2 
um, emissions as well in terms of our operations as you know cement manufacturers. So again, we're working with the grassroots farmers who otherwise would have thrown away palm kernels, who would have otherwise thrown away um, rice husks, and we're working with that to try and turn that into energy, which is obviously what we extract via co-processing, and turn that. So you can see the circularity working in that regard, and it's also a win-win in terms of the environment. These are huge things that can be scaled up, and we have scaled it up across the 75 markets. We're working with um, municipalities in Lagos State, for instance. Uh, we have a lot of uh, tire um, that are obviously waste again, and how can we turn that? So again, this is where scale can happen. And if you think about the entire ecosystem, it does indeed in impact a number of people. So I don't know if these illustrative examples, you know, uh, you know address that. that Not hey, they talk no Absolutely brilliant. Thank you. I can see that there are alarms ringing. I want to just reach out to the audience just very quickly and just say, you guys have been so awesome. I see we're still 114 people in the room. I'm moderating this and I'm exhausted. I know that listening is even harder. I just want to really just give a shout out to everyone who's listening to all the questions that are coming in. We're gonna summarize all those questions. Any ones that have not been answered, the ones that have been answered in a few minutes. We're doing the last salvo now. We're doing 30 seconds with parting lines. So each speaker, 30 seconds, what do you have to say to the audience, to this great, great, great audience that we have on this first stakeholders workshop? And with that, we'll close out this panel and I'll give Patrick Kabuya um, two minutes to absolutely close it out. Um, Omar Balane, you start first, 30 seconds. Let's see if you can keep yeah. doing it. Yeah, thank you. So um, just to say ESG is very important, um, is a journey and um, we need to just um, keep Keep on on that journey is the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Kola, over to you. Yeah, so thank you. you Salu yeah, yeah. Well, the company she was referencing was Salu Bata. So please, if you'd like to reach, reach out to them, let me know. I'll, I'll connect you. But uh, delighted to be a part of this conversation. Uh, for all the angels in the room, please hold your startups accountable. Uh, and uh, let's, let's just ensure we're putting money uh, uh, to, to back companies that are thinking about the impact of their businesses on Nigeria. God bless you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Paula Shade. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, mine is really a, a simple case for the um, introduction of sustainability reporting. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about, um, for, for companies, it's about creating value for shareholders, customers, employees, etc. Um, and really, it's, uh, it's important that they have confidence in the business model and strategy. I just want to share some stats I got from a, a recent research um, the, by the University of Oxford Smith School and our, our Arabicesk Asset Management that stated, 80% of studies show that stock price is positively correlated to good sustainability practices. 90% of relevant studies suggest that sound sustainability standards lower the cost of capital. And 88% of research suggests that there's a strong correlation between strong environmental, social, and governance practices. And obviously, um, the, the outcome of that is better operational performance. So clearly, it's important that you, you know, do have that how do you do it? Disclose, communicate, stakeholder analysis, and quite frankly, ensure that you, you know, address those uh, reporting issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fala Shade. Um, I am torn between these three. Um, how about Jarrett? All right, thanks. Uh, last couple of statements. I think a lot of what we talked about, a lot of what I've been talking about has been risk, you know, we talked, and even Fala Shade with the, the, the stats, which are really great. It's about risk, but you know what? I think if you do the reporting, you know, you take this stuff seriously, you build it into your business, you know, you make ESG part of your business model, which I think someone said earlier, which I thought was fantastic, you know, and you start thinking about forward progress. How are you going to tackle these ESG crises that we have, whether they're social or environmental or anything like that? And you start doing that and you start communicating that well, clearly, consistently to people like investors you know what then we can start talking about opportunities we don't have to talk about risks anymore we can start talking about opportunities and let's be honest opportunities that's what we want to talk about that's what everyone wants to talk about you know it's much more interesting it's much more exciting and it's much better for the future you know for everyone so i think that's the last thing i'll say opportunities <laughs> jared i'm bringing you to nigeria i'm going to make you a citizen <laughs> uh, Richard. Just like to follow on from Jared there, I think it's actually 
what he uh, like I echo everything he said it's kind of make your company the good person you would like it to be that's really what ESG is about you know climate the E the S and the G go for that I think there's a fantastic narrative for Nigeria and I think if they embrace ES or not if they embrace if if Nigerian businesses embrace ESG along with many other things that are required to grow you need capital you need different things it's just going to lead to a really bright future like I would be very confident that West Africa is going to be the growth story of the kind of next 50, 70 years. That's where the growth is going to come from. You know, the mature markets are slowing down, slowing down. And this is where the growth and the excitement, you got a lot of young people, you got a lot of talent coming on top, a lot of opportunities. And I just think, you know, if anything's being learned in the past 20, 30 years is that this is worth doing. So embed that into businesses as they, as they grow. Thank you so much, Richard. Benedict, over to you and then 60 seconds to Patrick and then we're closing this round. You guys have been great. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I, you know, this, uh, this is so much said already. Uh, I don't want to repeat, but I also think that not to forget what we haven't spoken about. Uh, we see in Europe and also in the US many regulations coming up and uh, actually creating a demand for sustainable investment opportunities and there's no supply. So. Uh, this is another opportunity for West Africa and for Nigeria and especially uh, to create these opportunities because investors are looking to it. And, um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's a strong demand. The demand is only growing because of the, uh, especially the regulations. I think this is an opportunity that uh, Nigeria, Nigeria or West Africa or Africa in general uh, should not let pass. And of course, I think we all around the table here are happy to help with that. Absolutely. And, and um, speaking from where you come from, um, Bene, and as I open the floor to Patrick to close us out on this session, thank you, keynote speaker, for listening to the panelists. And um, we know that the EU taxonomy, for example, has labeled fossil fuels as out. And we know, therefore, that accessing capital for large companies and small companies alike from the African continent, Nigeria in particular, becomes more and more challenging. Um, so, I mean, this situation is real. Also in terms of accessing capital, we have to put ESG on the table, not just from compliance though, but also from impact and access to capital. Patrick, how would you like to close? And there's a question here that says, do we now have a standardized method, method of measuring? And I think we'll take that in the way forwards. Over yeah. to you. Thank you, Dindi, and thanks to all the panelists. I'll just say three things, and I'm going to call it call for action. I'm sure for all of you who are listening, you've learned the benefit of this reform. So if you've not started, my first for, for, call for action, it's time to start. Start driving the reform in your, in your own organization. Secondly, I think it's become very clear we need to continue to work closely in partnership. What you're doing today, may bring more organization so we can support and influence the process. And we as the bank stand ready to continue to work with you and to partner with you in this reform. And I guess the third one is let's also challenge to Nigeria, let's influence the process. Let's not just work for our own country, but let's influence the design of these standards in the Africa region and globally. And that speaks to the standardizations of the measures. So there is a global move to have a sustainability standards board at IFRS Foundation, and that will issue global standards starting from November going forward. But with that, thank you very much once again for participating, and let's call for action at our own institution in partnership and in influencing the process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick, for rounding that up for me. Thank you. Really appreciate, really appreciate this panel. You guys were awesome. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. I learned a lot, and I really enjoyed um, being here. Um, thank you. I can see our chairman who has been, you know, steady and sturdy. I can see him applauding quietly, listening. He's really the person who challenged uh, me, challenged us all to get this together. And, um, you know, I'm just in awe. I know that we have an hour to go, and the hour to go is all about way forward. Um, you have the program, I'm sure, if I'm not, I'm going to put it in the chat right now. We're just three minutes behind schedule, and we're going to take that from the next. So by the next session, we're going to be back on time. I have the AFDB um, here, um, who was supposed to be in the opening. He was on a plane. 
and we also have Natalie doing the q and A. I I know that um, the DG Lasepa has been kicking me. I can see her face um, with lipstick matching her beautiful um, sweater. Um, and I know that she will wake you all up um, when she speaks and she's telling me that she needs to go, she needs to go. And we also have Ines who has a very, very exciting presentation. And so I'm going to say to Dr. Fashaway that I'm gonna take Ines because I want you to listen to her. It's about art and sustainability. And then I'm going to take yours. And then I'm going to ask Natalie to please just do a recap with all of that. And then we have everybody else on the way forward, starting with Professor Ofo, um, Professor Ameshi, Professor Okereke, Professor Miranda, and then our Director General of the IOD. I'm going to skip my um, session, but if we still have enough people here, I'd love to run the poll so we actually know who is um, in the room. So um, Ines, if I can ask you to project, if you're ready, and Dr. Fashaway, um, I'm just, I'm just going to check and make sure that I have, I'm not going to be murdered over the phone. <laughs> Are you going to project? Hi, Nidhi. Uh, shall I speak? Yes, we have so, to put the slides. Okay, so let me just put the slides. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank all of you for this kind of invitation from the IOD and Africardos, and especially Dr. Nidhi, uh, to participate in this webinar about sustainability and circular economy, uh, and give me the possibility to speak about how culture and art can actually contribute to this matter. And it's been quite insightful to listen to all of you guys. Um, just to give you a short summary of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, wait. Um, so I'm going to talk about how art can actually contribute to this and focus three main issue questions. How art can contribute to sustainability? How can you be involved and why you should invest in art? Um, as many of us, we know that nature has been a subject and source of inspiration for artists. But in recent decades, uh, this interest has been taken to a more uh, consequential implications as artists becoming more aware of climate change and related environmental catastrophes. Today, uh, we are living a very particular moment in history uh, in our planet where humans actually question their own existence, carbon footprint, related with the fourth industrial revolution powered by exponential technology acceleration where issues as Anthropocene, transhumanism, manipulation of DNA, uh, genetics, as well as all of these movements, how they influence and accelerate the new paradigm of transition. So I, I want you guys to imagine how it has been. Um, you've been experiencing this pandemic period in isolation without having the beauty of music, cinema, literature, and arts in general in our life. Um, we also testify that in many parts of the world, the wildlife and nature has actually returned to the metropolitan, metropolitan cities, uh, the coastlines, and which is like absolutely impressive. And I think this should be, this should be taken as an alert uh, to open our eyes to what is happening in the world. Although we keep struggling uh, with waste, and we which we produce in our world. Every year we produce more than 2 billion of tons and in Africa only recycles 4% of this. So I really think it's important for us to find solutions, educate people and organizations on it, but also art can have a role in all of this. And although we are all part of the problem, some artists also want to be part of the solution. And this is what I'm going to share with you guys. Uh, so a couple of artists, some in Africa and other ones in the global south, uh, which are with, through their practice, they address some of these environmental issues. Um, so the first one is the famous, super well-established uh, African artist, Ella Natsu, that became famous for recycling uh, bottle cans and making these impressive installations. Then, we have another major artist from Ghana, Serge, uh, that 
also became famous for recycling uh, the jerry cans, these yellow jerry cans that we see everywhere. Um, then we have Larry Tedrusso, also a Nigerian artist that transforms domestic waste into amazing art. Uh, this one is made of Maggie packs. You have other ones made with Dangote bags, uh, Lafardi bags. So he uses all of these materials and he recites them and make these extraordinary pieces. Uh, how do I change? Okay. We have Olamide as well, also a Nigerian artist that uses exactly the same materials that are totally discarded and we find in the streets of Lagos. Um, on the international scene, we have Agustin Moreira, which is a Brazilian artist, that he appropriates all of these discarded plastic lids that he finds in trash and creates these installations. Um, another major one, an Argentinian artist, Thomas Sarasen, that always focuses his practice on climate changes and finding solutions, how we can actually find an harmony with nature. Um, you can actually go inside of these bubbles and experience these uh, spaces. Um, and now, so Nandita Kumar from India, she actually merged um, science, technology um, into the, their practice. And she creates all of these really hyper-realistic uh, interactive works that actually they react to humidity and pollution and heat in the environment where the, the artwork is placed. Um, another artist from South Korea, uh, Bang Xiong Ji, that he works about uh, the relationship between natural materials and objects that are made by men. Um, and this extraordinary artist from American Brazilian artists that he built this project um, in Brazil with the biggest um, garbage dump in Brazil. And he actually tried to change the life of people in this place. Um, so he created these portraits of people that were workers in this dump. And with the sale of these artworks, so at least one artwork, which was $64,000, it totally returned to the community for them to uh, improve their labor union and educate and protect them because they didn't have any conditions at all. Uh, so it is important that art that has that has that matters. It creates always an impact, brings an awareness, communicates, investigates, uh, exposes really serious issues. Most of the time, engages with communities, but most of all, creates an awareness of the state of our world. So you can ask yourself, so. Why can you, how can you involve as a corporation? Um, so in 2019, Dangote did um, a week focus on sustainability and focus on waste managing and actually educate the population how they can actually work on those things. Um, so I, I'm going to show a short video of what it happened on that week. Please let me know if you can listen to this. The issue of environment is a major concern for me and for all of us. So I believe that's the only way I can refer to the solution. Rather than the great question is part of the problem, but I also want to be part of the so as a result of this uh, week, um, they are invited uh, Lane, as you can see in this, uh, this video. And during this presentation, this workshop, he did this huge artwork in collaboration with the youth. Um, that now you, the work is part of the um, uh, museum collection in Nigeria. And so you can make a huge impact by supporting and making all of these initiatives. Um, so why shall you invest in art? Um, well, it's from 
I work with a lot of clients all over the world and these major, the ones that are really major investment groups, they always see art as a fundamental part of their strategy to generate and invest and really to capitalize their wealth. Um, and it's pretty simple what is happening. It's like, you should always invest in art. It should be actually a rule uh, in our society and some of the benefits from to companies and corporations is like it brings always social responsibility. It can contribute and promote to the culture where the company is and brings valorization, visibility for the for the firm. And art is an asset to your company, and as an asset that is never tied to a stock exchange, so it doesn't devaluate as or, or oxalates like gold or petrol, crude or and diamonds. So it's the uh, the prospect of generating a, a high return of investment is really, really huge. And in some countries, you actually have tax benefits. I don't think in achieve this wise, but we have this in, in Europe and in other countries as well. So I do believe when you invest in art, you are actually investing in yourself. Um, so I just would like to end the short presentation uh, with a vote of thanks uh, to all corporations uh, in the country and because their contribution is actually creating an impact and making a difference. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ines. Thank you. And, and yes, I was part of that little project um, in the schools. And it's not just that waste can be used to create art, it can also actually be used as a major advocacy tool um, and especially with our kids in terms of just having a completely different mindset regarding how trash is viewed in our society today. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to be projecting on behalf of the Lapo right now. I know that um, Innocent is here waiting to also make a goodwill statement on behalf of AFDB. Um, he's been on the flight all this time and he's only just arrived. Um, so Dolakwa, are you here or should I let um, should I let Innocent go ahead? Dolakwa? Okay, Innocent, if you can take a minute and um, just speak to us, I'll take you um, first. Ines, again, thank you very much for that very exciting presentation. Really thank loved you. it. Thank you, Indidi. And uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm so sorry for joining this meeting very late. It's a very interesting meeting. Um, uh, it's, it, the meeting is coming at such a critical time. Uh, today marks um, Earth Day 2021. Um, there couldn't have been a better topic to discuss on this day. So thank you very much, Indidi, um, IOD. Africarios, and uh, of course, the Secular Economy Innovation Partnership. So on behalf of the African Development Bank, um, uh, I welcome you all. I thank you so much already for all the contributions that have been made. Uh, I listened within the last 25 minutes, and I heard that most of the issues that have been raised are issues that are pertinent for the African Development Bank. Um, as, you, as you all know, we have an integrated safeguards and sustainability framework that dates back to 2003. You know, this framework provides guidelines for integrated environmental and social impact assessments. And recently, uh, we also have a climate safeguard system that develops some um, toolkits for measuring our carbon food footprints in our operations. For example, we have a greenhouse gas accounting tool, we have an adaptation review and uh, um, uh, adaptation review uh, mechanism that also helps to profile climate change adaptation measures across all our projects. So as a bank, we've been doing all of this and also ensuring that we are uh, building the capacity of our regional member countries, including Nigeria, to ensure that these systems are being put in use. Um, so, so far, um, we realized that the bank cannot do it alone. And that is why the topic of this meeting is very, very critical and essential. Um, we require the Nigeria, Nigeria corporates to be able to take some of the steps that the bank and other multilateral development banks are doing. Um, this is because uh, the, 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 the business is huge. And just like someone already mentioned, uh, we are going to see it 
less of a risk and more of a business opportunity. Uh, all the concepts that are hinged on uh, ensuring green economy and green growth, for example. Um, uh, in, in Nigeria, um, we have a circular economy working group, for example, that is trying to improve the ESG systems uh, by including uh, circularity in our, in our environmental assessment and in our project evaluation. So um, some of these aspects, you know, we are intending to ensure that it's able to improve the current status of our ESG measurement and performances. So I'd like to use this opportunity to invite other Nigeria corporates present on this call. The, the working group is very strategic because it's a voluntary group of multi-sectoral professionals from government, international organizations, private sector, the academia, and also some non-state actors. For the advertising. So, um, yeah, sorry, Arama, indeed. Yeah, it, it's also important to, to invite other corporates so that they can join the beautiful thing that we are doing. Uh, mm -hmm. One key aspect that the working group seeks to achieve is to ensure that we are able to design a measurement reporting and verification framework for, for the circular economy within the Nigerian context. Uh, this is very important and it requires the input of everyone on this call. Um, okay. be it, um, because otherwise I will completely run into trouble. Yeah, I understand that. Okay, yeah. So um, basically this framework uh, is, is an open invitation. Uh, we're going to be reaching out to as many uh, uh, participants on this call to ensure that we're able to capture all the sustainability challenges that you have, the gaps, so as to help or assist the government of Nigeria to develop a circular economy economy roadmap. Because at the, at the tail end, this roadmap will fit into updating our ESG framework, which will benefit all the Nigerian corporates and also the government of Nigeria in both achieving their sustainable development goals and also their nationally determined contributions. So I'd just like to stop here and just to wish everyone um, a successful um, discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Lidi, for the time. Yeah, thanks, I appreciate it. And I'm glad you could join us after all. And we're hoping that this will go from, in fact, not we're hoping, we're tasking you to move this from talk to action because we need to invest in these things. And that's what we count on the African Development Bank to do. And you in particular, to help us cut through the red tape so that our small and growing businesses actually will benefit from this. Just give me the thumbs up if that's a yes. Definitely, you have a partner here. Definitely, you have a partner here. <laughs> I've launched Thanks, everyone. a poll. Thank you so much. Thank you. I've launched a poll and I'm asking if we can please just respond to the poll. The poll is up already. It will run in tandem. Um, Dolakpa, if you're here, I'm actually going to project your slides right now. Um, I don't know if you can see them on my screen. And then the spotlight will be on you. So you have um, five minutes, and then I'm going to call on you, um, Dr. Banish, Natalie, um, to just wrap up um, the last two panels that we've had in your very um, expert and experienced way, like nobody else can. I have 21 responses now on the poll. I'm asking all 71 to please try to just respond. It will be very useful in terms of us taking this forward. Over to you, Dolapo. Indeed, can you see me now? Yes, I can see you. Yes, I can see you. Can okay, you see great. Well? So, yes. Brilliant. Good afternoon, everyone. Evening. And um, I have this big presentation, but I have listened to everyone carefully. And I'm just going to breeze through this and um, support or disagree or critically acclaim some of the stuff I have heard in the course of this discussion. So in the just next slide. Did they? We know what this is really. So, and I would not, yeah, I would really not want to focus on when we're talking um, um, sustainability and we're talking governance and transparency. I do not want to focus on waste to wealth. It's just one work stream out of many. Circular economy and sustainability covers life. It covers the people, the planet, and profits. Now, I'm going to go back to some of the guys I've heard here today. 
Mrs. Ambrose had said, we should consider the social implications of what we're trying to do. Now we're going into people. They're religious, for example, they're religious, um, 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 I, what's the word? Tenants that guide how some people do business and how secular economy can be run. Their personal issues like, oh, I don't mind, I don't, I don't intend to make money. However, I am happy that I am doing good for the planet. That is very important and advocacy takes us there. And that's why I am very, very grateful to IOG, to CEIC and to everyone here that they've given me an opportunity to talk as an environmental protection agency. I mix things up, sorry. My name is Dolako Fashawe. I'm the general manager of Lagos State Environmental Protection Agency. I am a medical doctor, public health physician, who after 20 years um, realized, not decided, realized that the health impact of the environment is what we need to start to look at. And um, um, prevention, prevention instead of treatment. And that takes us back to sustainability in all we do. So now creating a circular economy, we all know what this is. And in Nigeria, we're talking mostly about plastics, especially PET. But I am happy to agree with the third to the last speaker who said we could even start to look at vegetal waste, food waste, um, e-waste, construction waste, they were all mentioned here. There are things that we can start to play around with, lead into a circle with no loophole and with everybody being a player. Now, ESG and circular economy. The thing about ESG, when I was doing my desk review, is that um, I don't know if anyone has heard about Sullivan's principle. Sometime in, um, in the UN, about 2021, 20, 2019 or something, Sullivan and um, this African guy, what's his name in Didi? Um, African UN. Not Andrew Young. Who? Leon Sullivan. No, Co African. Kojo, 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 someone Kojo. Mm -hmm. Kojo Williams. So they had come up with this Sullivan principle that was strictly focused on ESG. I will go back to Mrs. Ambrose's slide now. Are the people happy? Is the planet happy? And is it giving profitability? And now, most especially, is government rising up to the occasion? Business ethics, compliance, board independence, are we treating our staff right? And are we getting this data out to the right people? Now, SDG 17, not just 17, I actually have crammed all the SDGs. So eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 16, and 17, all talk to these issues. Everything talks to Sullivan's principle, and everything talks to ESG. ESG is, is to me a concept that has been practiced forever, but now we want to make it scientific, make it evidence-based, make, make it justifiable. How do we get um, the private sector, for example? I've been in a meeting today with Miss um, Thompson, yeah, who made it clear that the public private sector they don't trust the public sector and at times both ways so when we are talking to funders in this room i am saying categorically on behalf of Lagos state governments that we have the political will the governor just gave a talk at the last secular economy meeting in the netherlands or something and he let's call it state determined action he made his own state determined action and as md of la sepa I am making my nationally determined contribution. For example, we have decided to extend incentives to man by them treating their effluents of whatever they're manufacturing, treated better 
we have an effluent treatment plant in La Sepa. So before we release into the water bodies, we have um, clean, usable water that doesn't affect the ecosystem and it comes right back to us. Also, we are talking about hybriding our buses in La Sepa. We have actually done one to see the cost effects and cost benefit analysis of using gas and, and petrol. And I am saying all of this because ESG sounds theoretical, especially as there's no financial, there's no financial impact or anything to touch in your books, especially for the private sector. It's just, we have reported this data, we have done this, we have tried to improve on this. So you government, what do you have in return for us? That will take me to the green bonds. That will take me to responsible, sustainable banking. That will take me to sustainable fashion. I loved what um, the last speaker said about fashion. If, for example, this is a project we were talking about in La Sepa, and I'm happy to, to ask for funds and grants here. We say everyone that has a pair of jeans, I saw this in Paris somewhere, everything in that store, including pencils and pencil cases and school bags are made of jeans. Every child has a pair of jeans in school. When you say, let's catch them young, let's go and teach arts. It doesn't necessarily have to be fine art. It could be creative arts. We say, bring your jeans, you turn it to a school bag. When it's tired of being a school bag, it becomes a pencil case. When it's tired of becoming a pencil case, I, as environmental protection, will take it from you and recycle and start all over again. That was why my first slide was waste or wealth. But the conversation has gone way beyond that. Now, how do we enforce that people give us data? How do we show transparency even the govern government has to show transparency because at times we go out there looking for data and they're looking at us like, oh, you're about to bring up more taxes. You're about, about to make unfriendly policies. We have to advocate, advocate, advocate and explain what ESG is and how it will benefit us. Mrs. Samson, I would mention again, keeps saying that what is the need for me? That is what the average consumer wants to hear. Even the implementer, what is in it for me, including government. This is a picture showing the Ministry of Environment launching environmental protection and environmental um, um, education handbooks for teachers. We would, it's, 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 it's an extracurricular now because we can't put it into the core curricula without all the bureaucracy of the federal government. But with funding agencies, with um, people like Africarius, we can make it extracurricular nationwide. We can build clubs, we can build arts institutions, we can, we can have innovation orbs like we're trying right now. And before I close, I want to say that it's always important to have a mission statement. What we're trying to do here, we, we should, we should indeed come up with a mission statement that is clear. It shows our overall goal. It shows the benefits to the customer, the markets, and of course, to the public sector, which I belong to. Thank you. See why you, you are always good at the beginning at a forum because you're always so motivational and practical and pragmatic with color and with light and with beauty and brains. So, um, but it, it, nobody else could wake everybody in the audience up and ensure that we're still holding on to 87 participants after almost four hours. We have, um, thank you Dolakwa so very much. I know that this is not a talk shop because we are actually working actively to realize a lot of these things. So thank you very much for taking the time to come today. Um, we have a few more comments actually from Professor Kenneth um, who's been working very strongly on data 
um, but also on sustainability and circularity, Professor Miranda, who's been working very strongly on data, but on capacity building for how do we collect and clean and use that data to drive innovation from Professor Offo, who is from the IOD and whose voice is absolutely critical from Dr. Bainish, who I'm looking for, yes, who was going to, who is from CIP. She's the executive director of CIP and Dele Alimi, who has been here from the beginning, has been working very hard behind the scenes to make this real. And our own chairman, um, Mr. Okunoro, who has started before this started and will comment just before this ends. And um, we also have a poll, which is almost complete. So I'd like to ask now, um, Dolakwa, I'm hoping you can stay just a little bit longer because I'm sure there might be one or two questions for you. Um, I'd like to ask Professor Ofo if he's actually available and Professor Chukumerije who talks about um, memories of the future. Um, both of you to, to put your voice um, forward as we move towards the closing of this session. And we are on average three to five minutes um, um, per panel. Professor Ofo, welcome. Welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Ndidi. Do I have the floor now? The floor is absolutely yours. Thank you very much. Let me uh, appreciate everybody who has been part of this program. And to say that um, at IOD, what we have tried to do is to more like uh, raise the tempo. Um, fortunately, uh, sustainability is an item in the uh, Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance 2018. And you know that companies have started uh, reporting on this now. So it is now a matter that is, uh, so to speak, in the front uh, burners. And what IOD is trying to do is to now get uh, sustainability issues to be a serious matter at board level. So it's not just uh, nice to do. And truly with the Nigerian Code of Corporate Governance, it becomes mandatory because it is uh, the code, you know, is a principle, but you have the principles that are mandatory and then you have the recommended practices. Now that companies will begin to report on their sustainability practices, you now know that they will now begin to uh, take it uh, much more seriously than before. Because as you know, in management, anything that is not measured does not get done. But now companies by virtue of the NCCG uh, will be required to report on what they are doing in terms of sustainability. And so IOD is now uh, using this uh, platform and subsequent ones that will come to uh, put this matter before the directors and ensure that they are taking steps to uh, ensure that things happen in, in this space. You know, so it's not just a nice to do thing. It is something that every company will need to do to remain relevant because it's not just about profit but you must care about the planet, you know, you must care about the people and then profit will come. Uh, companies now are focused on sustainability and uh, not just about profit because there is no point making profit today and not be around tomorrow, which is actually a problem that we have in this part of the world. We have businesses that are thriving. After a couple of years, they cease to exist. So they, they, they are not sustainable because maybe the, the, the vision had died or the person who created, who established the business is no more. But with sustainability practices in place, that story, that narrative will change. And IOD is uh, prepared and willing to drive that uh, narrative and to push, to advocate for this to be uh, in the DNA. And as you know, it is a journey. It's not a, it's not a final destination, but IOD is taking it on board and it will continue. Thank you very much. Thank Prof, you. can I ask a question? Sorry, Ndidi. All right. Professor, good evening. You were good. very, very careful with your words. <laughs> you did say it is acceptable to make this report, and you did say it is um, mandatory. Are you saying it is the law and we can actually enforce it? It's just a question. To be honest, um, this will be enforced, but not in the sense of 
putting people in prison. But because nah, they are, no, uh -huh. just <laughs> from what? advocacy, we remind them, we remind, remind, exactly, remind. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And question them if they don't do it because the code is there that requires them to do it. So if they don't do it, they must explain why they are not doing it and they will be questioned. And did they permit me to share with this group something yeah. you and I discussed? that we would start certifying businesses, maybe not eco-friendly, but green as an environmental protection agency. So that sticker on your building as green is um, part of the incentives, if not financial, like he has said. So you are not giving us reports and we don't give you the green sticker. And then we make advocacy that if you don't have the green sticker, you're not, you're not, um, compliance. So there are different ways we can enforce without them um, going to prison or asking for money or taxes. The private sector, they hate that. They will not deal. <laughs> that is the truth. You can, you, can, you, can really get, you can really enforce it without sending people to prison. Mm -hmm. I think, I you think will tell us how, sir. Yeah, I, th I think, um, Dolakpa, what we appreciate about you, what we like about you, is we know the pressure that's on you to enforce and to regulate, and we appreciate that you're actually working with us from a private sector perspective to find a win-win that works for people, planet, profit, that works for the public sector, the private sector, and also the um, civil society. So we'll keep working on that, um, even offline once we're done with this conference. Um, I think in that, that's actually a good time to call on Professor Chukumiriji if he's here, um, because he is working on scenario planning and um, something called memories of the future, where sustainability and circularity actually plays quite a central role. Um, Prof, you have about three minutes. Thank you very much, Dr. Andidi. Thank you very much, um, panelists and everybody um, for, for, for coming together for us to discuss this very, very important subject. Uh, I'm sorry for coming late. I just came off um, uh, a meeting. We're discussing about you know, the, the Biden Climate Summit, which is happening now. And uh, I was tasked to give some input into Africa's positioning uh, for what may come out of this summit. Let me just remind us what many of you may already touch, uh, have touched upon uh, uh, before now. Um, the uh, investment in clean technology has been the fastest growing of almost all the sectors since 2013. Uh, for in 2013, it was what about 418 million, and now we're talking about 16 billion investment per, per annum. And according to the work that we have done in the IPCC, we are projecting about 3.6 trillion investment in clean technology between now and 2015, uh, 2030, as more and more countries begin to ratchet up uh, their pledge to, uh, to go carbon neutral. Many of you will know that Biden today uh, has now said that uh, uh, he will uh, lead America to half uh, their climate uh, emission uh, between now and 2030. Uh, and so what we are seeing is a movement away from the uh, exploitative model of economic growth to uh, the green uh, or, uh, type of uh, economic growth. And it is well accepted in all the discourses of uh, uh, conversations that I'm part of that this cannot happen without the active participation of the private sector. I know that in Nigeria, there are so much that is already being done, while also accepting there is much more to be done. There is a reason why, despite the uh, huge fall in emission uh, because of the pandemic, where there's a reason why uh, the uh, climate, uh, clean technology, uh, whether it's uh, uh, renewable or, um, uh, uh, or, or uh, clean uh, vehicles, uh, maintained uh, their, their, their stock uh, share uh, throughout uh, 2020 and, and increased. And there's a reason why Tesla 
is now much more profitable than GM uh, and Volkswagen combined. And Mercedes. And Mercedes. So there's so. This, <laughs> Thank you, Dalabo. This is not now, we are not, we've gone past the era where this is kind of an optional extra for any company. This is the future and it is in our interest, the interest of any corporation to think hard about how to position itself, but also collectively in as we transit to what I call the green future. So by, by, by memory of the future, we're really thinking in long terms. How will the future look like? How will 2030 look like? How will 2050 look like? As I already indicated, we have about 14 principalities and 22 uh, countries that have pledged that they will not allow uh, or use uh, fossil fuel in their jurisdiction from anything between 2032 to 2050. And Europe, as at two weeks ago, has now put into law, uh, their own law, uh, that they will go carbon neutral by 2050. So we need not only as, uh, as individual companies, but as a collective to be thinking about what the future may look like and step back and plan and decide what we need to be doing today in order to be relevant for the future. Uh, and uh, a project that I'm, I'm working uh, with in Didi and Professor Amish and a few others are uh, really uh, bringing uh, corporate leaders, but also political leaders, professionals to really imagine what the future may look like and how as a country, of course, uh, with uh, emphasis on corporate action can be positioning ourselves, not to be playing catch up, but to be uh, leaders and be relevant uh, going forward. And ESG measuring, uh, monitoring, evaluating, reporting is a crucial part of helping to steer that ship away from the wrong direction to the right direction. And I look forward to working uh, with uh, the top brains that we have here uh, to decide and to impute uh, into the process as uh, you guys uh, you know, make the, the, the decision uh, to position Nigeria and the corporate sector in Nigeria to be relevant for the future. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you, you Prof. Much, Prof. We're, counting, Prof, we're counting. Prof, we're Prof said my name. I have to thank him for saying Dolakpo. By the way, Dolakpo is, is officially the co-facilitator now until the end. So there's nothing that I do that she's not <laughs> part of. No, no, no. I know Professor Choko Merije. I have profiled him. He mentioned my name. I'm humbled. Okay. Prof, I hope you heard that. She's going to come back at you. We have to work together to build these memories of the future on the environmental side. And, and it's Sarah, possible in the day. Do you know that 8.4 billion grants was given to a bank in the UK towards ESG? is amongst the fastest growing investment pro pro products. In, 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 in the US. I just saw this somewhere, 8.4 billion. Sorry, grants. can I just say that, that, that I, I will take you up. I'm actually already working on something that resembles what you described in terms of um, rating companies on their yeah, greenness. So I will be in touch so that we can join forces and make this happen. Brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. Serge, Hello, Andy. Yes, I'm here. Okay, brilliant. So the ball is in your court. And okay. Natalie, you're here as well. And May I have a Serge. chance to see my slide or can I share my presentation? Go ahead, you can share. So you have three minutes. Okay, I know I have three minutes. Serge is, is essentially one of the inventors, co-creators and drivers of um, Europe's Silicon Valley, has done a lot of work with um, data and is also very keen to work with us on the capacity to understand big data, AI, and um, where do we go from here in terms of measuring ESG. Um, three minutes, Serge, and then Dr. Okay. Natalie. So thanks, Ndidi, for this invitation and for this opportunity to talk about um, what I'm uh, 
passionating involved today, which is um, what I call multiversity. In a couple of minutes, you will know pretty well what I mean here. And I'm talking about sustainable higher education. And that's part of uh, my activity today. Just uh, to be complimentary to the previous uh, uh, colleague, I would say that uh, definitely we are entering a new disruptive era in computer science, I'm professor in computer science, which is the era of science of data. And that's um, Jim Gray, we said about uh, the, we got the Turing Award, we defined perfectly what is this fourth paradigm of science. That means we are surrounded by huge amount of data, which should, which needs to be managed and analyzed. And as far as we're talking about that, every sector of the economy could be circular economy, could be traditional economy, will be impacted by the fact that today we have this capability of uh, analyzing data and enriching every job. Um, and there is a major demand, and we'll just comment this slide here, and I, I left complimentary slide to Andidi. Um, what is important here is that we're facing what I wrote down here, the skill crisis. So before 2025, half of the active jobs on the planet will need upskilling. That's the World Economic Forum and many other organizations will determine that. And traditional universities are not capable of providing short-term certificates leading to jobs. So what we need today is to look at this huge opportunity to do upskilling or reskilling of active workers. And that's part of a major challenge we're facing today in higher education. And I would, since I'm professor at university, I've been professor for 40 years. Um, I would say that we see the decline of traditional universities and the rising of higher education. And uh, one is top down, the other is bottom up, starting from the market. And here, um, I talk about Centripeti University. So traditionally, you go to university to get a degree. Uh, it takes three years, two years, depending on the degree, and then you have it. But you have to go. And today, we're facing a disruptive moment, uh, completely different. And that's the reason why I use this term multiversity, which has been defined by uh, Clark Keir, uh, who was a rector of Berkeley University in the 60s, before the uprising of uh, American universities, mm -hmm. where university faced the first disruptive time of becoming a knowledge industry. And today we are facing the same disruptive situation in front of mass education, uh, which is needed not only in uh, in Europe, but in Africa and in Nigeria, everywhere on the planet is the same issue, mass education, mass higher education. And one dimension, which has been amplified by the COVID, by the fact, is uh, e-learning. And the MOOC, an example of this dimension is what has been defined 10 years ago in um, Stanford University, and everything gets started there, that's a MOOC, Massively Open Online Courses, and build degrees on that. So we have been, uh, in Europe, we have been working on putting two master degrees online in computer science with the idea of uh, disseminating uh, this approach of learning based upon skills. And um, our ambition uh, with you and Didi is to try to define how we could implement degrees or part of degrees in order to educate and do this uh, transition towards the future of this data economy on digital circular economy. And um, we'll be active this year in Africa in um, four different countries where we will define, for instance, a popularization MOOC on artificial intelligence for any student in any discipline in order to demonstrate the added value of data analysis with deep learning tools, uh, with AI tools, which are open source today in order to demonstrate the added value of new services we can implement. Every job on the planet 
in Africa and other will be drastically impacted by data analysis in the future. Not only health, not only uh, um, traditional industry, agriculture, every type of service, payment, etc., finance. So I would say that today, in the future, in order to uh, give um, a, a keyword, in order to illustrate this vision of higher education, I use that word of multiversity because it is not a unique way to get degree. You have multiple ways to get degree. And one dimension is e-learning. And that's a way to address also massive education at higher education, which is a great challenge for our small planet. Professor, that's, brilliant, brilliant. that's it, three minutes. Um, yes. As you okay. ask uh, NDD, I can, of course, answer questions or queries and um, eventually comment. But for three minutes, that's the key word I would like to say. We are well, drastic. We are in a new era of higher education. With the demand of the market, our short-term uh, certificates leading to jobs. Yes. And that's what we're working on. And traditional universities didn't em emphasize that point. It's long-term education and the professional oriented could be professional. But in the day, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry to cut you short, Prof. Indeed, are you aware that the National Open University and a lot of polytechnics are trying to do what Prof is saying right now? Yeah, yeah I know. I know that in Nigeria, you have this open university very active there, like in many other, other countries, like the Open University. So uh, I want to suggest Senegal. that this works, this working group, put, we put Prof in touch with the Federal Ministry of Education right away. Okay, done. So Dolakwa, I'll pick this up with you. Um, mm -hmm. You know you're my co-chair of this closing session and this is the action session. So you're co-responsible and Serge, I've been trying to tell Serge that, look, if you open the tap for Serge, he will talk for you for the next hour. Not just <laughs> We can get Serge to later. No, no, but uh, Delapo, I will be very glad to keep talking with you on that matter and see how we can do great synergies between uh, what's existing there and what, what we do in it? Europe. Moak. What did you call it? M oh. Multi, multi Multiversity. I will connect. Multiversity. You. University yeah. means unique somewhere. Multiversity means multiple, multiple Thank you dimensions for the to get. education. Brilliant. Professor. Okay. Indeed, the connectors, I'm yes, interested. Yes, yes. My mom is a professor of education, by the way. She's been for 40 years. I'm sure they would have some things in common. Brilliant. And with NDD, we have the small ambition to create the first virtual multiversity in Africa. Brilliant. Nigeria. Lagos. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. I'm, I'm so glad. Okay, so next action point is very clear. Dolakwa, I'm very glad that you're picking up this mandate with me subsequently, and I would like to drive us towards closure. Um, Dr. Bainish, Natalie, I'm asking you to um, put in and chip in a few action points from a CEIP perspective. Kenneth, you're coming right after that, and then Dele, I'm handing over to you. I'm conscious that we're two minutes over time now, and so time is of essence. Serge, very, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule. You're going to have to help me stop no, sharing. Thank you very much, Ndidi, to you. Pleasure, pleasure. I'm glad to have you here. And I look forward to realizing this ambition. We keep saying it's a journey, it's a journey, it's a journey. This is just one step. Um, next time you'll have longer to speak and to act. You need to help me stop sharing your screen. Oh, I, I, I can actually I can do that. Okay, Indeed, but... can you can you please share everyone's email? Um, yes. So the we... different work streams can start to talk. Yes, we'll do. We will coordinate Thank you. Action after this. We'll do. Okay, excellent. So, um, Natalie, are you here? And Kenneth, are you are you here? Thank you. No, Natalie, over to you. Hi. Um, so I was originally meant to field the uh, questions and answers, um, and um, I think now we've moved into um, <clears throat> closing remarks, uh, where I think also my kids want to join me for this session too. So um, I think I'm going to be very, very quick uh, and maybe pull on uh, 
two themes that were raised thinking of this I was that I was uh, looking at the question and answer session um I think in pulling back down from from where we were, were right now I uh, you know I think was interesting in the, in the question and answers that were that were conducted is that um you know I, I saw like a couple themes come out and one is really this uh um, tension, or I don't know what I don't know, a relationship between kind of startups and uh, smaller organizations and NGOs that want to work with with larger companies that have the resources uh, to to um, uh, to really invest in in the solutions that those organizations are are proposing. So I think um, really based on this on this forum, I think another you know a next step is really around supporting those organizations, those participants that are in these kinds of sessions to. Uh, help them with their expectations, how to present, uh, where to access uh, these kinds of resources so that they're also uh, really working step in step to uh, to create those solutions alongside as well. Um, I think the other uh, item that was raised in, in the chat, uh, which I'll just touch on now, there were several themes, uh, is around, again, this uh, the relationship between the SMEs and international companies. So uh, it was kind of international or larger companies that were on the panel. Panel, um, but the question was raised, well, you know, how does it, how does this work uh, uh, for, for SMEs? And I think one valuable starting point there is, um, is to look at uh, maybe start some storytelling uh, in terms of the relationship of, of, of those larger companies with their suppliers, because there has been a lot of work Work done that helps show how you can operationalize um, these kinds of activities uh, in a smaller organization. So, so being a little bit clear about what those resources are that are that are needed uh, to, to do that, I think will be helpful. Um, one quick one, I think, is also on regulation. I thought again because Dolapo mentioned it around the green. Um, uh, the green credentials. Uh, it was also very, I think, really, really interesting. And, uh, and I think that also sits within the corporate governance framework is that there are tools out there to, uh, to, to regulate and, uh, and, and working together. Um, I think we can, we can also uh, act as kind of entrepreneurs ourselves to, to take advantage of those, uh, to, to um, move regulation around ESG uh, topics at, at the board level so they get the attention that they deserve. I'll leave it there. Um, it's been an exciting session and uh, looking forward to the, to the next steps. Thank you, Natalie. What happened to the kids talking? I was waiting. Natalie. No, the kids are, are very structured and well behaved. They're used to that. <laughs> <laughs> they said they were going to answer the questions. I was waiting. <laughs> they're going to be in our behavioral change programs for schools. We shall ask, we shall bring them in. Kenneth, I see you're here, ready to add your profound statements of wisdom and connect it to some of the other initiatives that are live and on stream. Over to you. And Dele, you're next. Thank you very much, Indira. I think you're the only one who can keep people um, this number around for four hours. So well done, uh, it's uh, typical. So um, for me, just to reflect on what I've had so far. So whether we call it sustainability or circular economy or uh, multiversity and so on and so forth. One thing I see from the private sector perspective is the issue of self-regulation. And here we are talking about impacts and these impacts can be negative or positive depending on how we look at them. So self-regulation matters. And how can companies themselves, organizations, leverage on this issue of self-regulation? So Dalapo talked about government and the issue of trust between government and private sector, as well as you can also add the, the, the thought sector here. But irrespective of those challenges, we need to think about what I may call partnered governance, collaborative mm -hmm. governance. And it's for us, again, to collectively think of the sort of regulatory or governance design that will enable us achieve that collaboration. So it's not one where the government is lauding it over the private sector or the private sector is trying to undermine the government. So what we have here is, is, a, is a good example of a wicked problem. How we solve that problem is not completely dependent on one actor. And that's where Goal 17 becomes even more important on the issue of partnership. 
And I, I can hear some conversations so far, you know, Chooks is saying, oh, I, I will talk to the lab one, then the professor that just spoke again. So how can we begin to forge these relationships? And probably the next step going forward to translate these ideas into action is to be imaginative enough to see how we can overcome the different challenges that might come in the way. It's a journey, but it's not an easy journey. Let's not kid ourselves. And it's our steadfastness, our courage, our strength that will enable us to go through. And more also our humility, because when we fail, we should also be, be kind enough to ourselves to accept that this is not an easy journey. So Didi, I want to thank you for this opportunity. And I hope that it, it doesn't end here. It will surely, surely continue and we can translate things into action together. So thank you very much. I, I just want to say something to all the fund makers or grant makers in this forum. We can make things happen. We're ready to go. For example, in Lagos State, we could have the first multiversity without going through the federal government. After all, we have state universities. It's such an innovation. In the, do you remember we were talking about innovation of just things, new things? And then we train these kids on sustainability right from the scratch. I like the idea of multiversity and arts more than SDGs right now. Me too. I love it. Thank you for that vote. You know, <laughs> and my co-moderator, I just got a message um, from um, someone saying, I love your co-moderator. Okay, so we're fast at the end. We're 10 minutes over schedule. Um, I want to hand over to the Director General of the Institute of Directors. And I see that our chairman is very much here, has been here before we started and is here after we've ended. This is the thing I only say about, I wake up every morning and say, dear Lord, who has seen the end from the beginning, please take charge of my day. And, um, you know, it's just been such a great pleasure to have started this in your office, Mr. Chairman, in 2019 with Dilly. I must commend you, Dilly, for persisting and for sticking with it and for giving us all the freedom to be as creative. We started with three people. We ended up with a massive stakeholder workshop. And um, I give you the closing word right now. It's been an honor to moderate. I've thoroughly enjoyed myself and I've learned so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ndili. Uh, uh, I'm really very, very grateful. And I think I should also be grateful to you that uh, uh, you, you never stopped uh, dreaming about this. And I'm happy that we've made the intro and um, particularly uh, uh, concentrating on that word intro. This is just the introduction. The Institute is still going to do so much more in this sphere. And uh, we'll be counting on everybody here today uh, for, for the very important support to make this happen. Uh, the Institute has adopted this as a pet project. And um, like I told you during the preparation for this program, it's not just going to be uh, the stakeholder workshops that we're still going to hold many of. It's also going to be capacity development. We're going to go in partnership with the organization, we're going to actually go into actual training. We're going to train people on how this should be done. We're going to go beyond uh, these um, general talks into specifics. And we're, of course, going to be needing the support and assistance of everybody here today. I've also enjoyed myself thoroughly. I thought it was going to be a boring event when I saw three, four hours. But really, I've been here all the while, and I've taken so much. I've taken so much away. Um, uh, I, I don't want to spend too much time now because that has been done. And I think so much has been said in the last four hours or thereabout. Um, I would just want to say a very big thank you to our partners first, our partners who have made this happen together with us. Avikeros, I would say a very big thank you. Uh, Green Business Foundation, and of course, Akula Economy uh, Innovation Partnership and the Sarah Project. We thank these partners and we look forward to working more with you to ensure this happen. We've had about 30 speakers today, 30 speakers. Uh, we've had three keynotes. Uh, we've had, uh, I think, uh, six 
um, goodwill. 12 panelists, six way forward speakers, and of course our moderator. And of course that's not even counting the president. So we've had about 32 speakers and um, it, it's been thoroughly educative. It will be impossible for me to mention everybody uh, uh, individually, and I, I hope you pardon me for this, but I want to express the appreciation of the Institute to you all for, for the support we've gotten from you and for staying with us this long. Um, it is important that we together take this beyond here. Uh, and I'm happy you've all expressed the same sentiment that I'm expressing here. Uh, it, it's a partnership thing and we'll be able and willing to work with the legal state government and all these parastators who are involved with this. It would be wonderful to work with uh, uh, Dolapo. Uh, she's a very bright and bubbly person and I look forward to working with her more on this. Uh, you don't need to thank me for that, madam. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I also want to thank the president uh, who has been with us since 20, 2019 when we started this journey and he's also here today. I want to thank, uh, I want to thank uh, the chairman of the Research and Advocacy Committee of the Institute, Professor Nato Four, who also doubled today here as uh, somebody who spoke on the way forward, how we take things forward. And there were everybody who has contributed to, to make this happen. I say thank you. Ndidi, you've been wonderful. You've been a wonderful moderator. I have not seen any moderator on any webinar. Moderate a program with 24 speakers or 30 speakers. You've done that. You are great. Thank you very much. And I want to thank the, the participants. I want to thank everybody for taking their time to be here. It's been a wonderful event. Thank you very much. I think we'll just have a last word from Mr. President. Mr. President, sir. Uh, distinguished um, speakers, panelists, and friends of our institute. I, I mean, the DG has offered a, a position, but I cannot but express a, a really deep, a, a profound thank you to all the members, all of you who are here today. Um, indeed, thank you very much, because um, when we started out in, 20, in November 2019, we didn't think it was going to be like this, but I'd like to say that this is just a starter. Um, we're hoping that we would, in the course of the year, we would do much more. Um, be rest assured that the IOD will stand shoulder to shoulder with you and with all our panelists in ensuring that the issues of sustainability and the secular, uh, what I do, is, 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 uh, uh, is taken care of. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful experience for me. Uh, and God bless you all. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you very it's, much. It's, it's, it's always nice to talk to the private sector and we're not sounding like ignorance. So thank you for <laughs> thank you. for the lapos. Even Chief Okunawa said Dolako. I'm humbled. I've heard four Dolakos. <laughs>